my job properly. Uh, but uh, there are a few announcements before we start with our first uh, speaker. So I will uh, first give the word to uh, Alberto Bassett uh, for a uh, first announcement. No, it's, uh, it's a very short uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, simply to say that uh, we have organized this conference uh, around uh, the thematic core service of uh, life that we have our strategic working plan, but we need to work more on that. So we were planning uh, to start from uh, September to organize a number of, uh, what well, to ask the national notes, to organize together uh, a number of uh, uh, short thematic meeting in order to finalize the discussion and support the strong collaboration of all the distributed center on each of the thematic uh, for services. So we will receive a mail of you uh, with uh, such indication, the proposal of uh, candidature in order to host uh, this meeting and to organize a double time of the meeting in order to make the working and uh, all of us working together. That is the only from my side. Thank you, Alberto. So uh, now it's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Christoph Apalitidis, our CEO, who will uh, give a broad overview of the life force infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Alberto, colleagues. Um, um, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, go through this presentation uh, with uh, and, and, and share, you know, the, the, the vision for the next years with you. Uh, we've been working, you know, quite hard on this, and uh, this time around it was not like uh, the first uh, implementation period because we engaged very much all the distributed centers had to make sure that all of the colleagues and therefore the community behind uh, can be part of this and therefore it can be co-designed and, and co-developed. And I think that uh, in the last year, somehow we have been, you know, uh, quite successful in this dialogue. We exchanged uh, tons of mails. We, we listened uh, to all of you. We tried, you know, to make, uh, to make a good synthesis. And I think that above all, um, uh, the uh, final version, which is, uh, uh, which is being uh, worked out, you know, right now, will be available to all of you uh, in, uh, 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 after the next General Assembly, which is on, uh, at the end of uh, the month. But nothing changes. Nothing changes in, in terms of uh, of uh, deliverables and uh, and our obligations in the uh, board, in the uh, new strategic working plan. Anyway, I have to share this uh, um, um, this presentation uh, with uh, a few colleagues from uh, the uh, uh, ICT core because uh, they are going to present, you know, the, the new sections in Leibniz, uh, Eric, um, but um, that will come, you know, later on. First of all, for the audience uh, who, which is not uh, very familiar with the concept of research infrastructures, uh, this is uh, the definition that has been uh, given by the ESFRI uh, um, uh, committee in, uh, in the EU. So we are organizations that we aim to enable uh, this, the research community to use facilities or resources or services in order to accelerate their, their achievements and in order to be able uh, to make uh, sustainable research. And that means one thing, we do not make research per se as research infrastructure. We facilitate those who are carrying out research. Of course we are involved. Of course, we are trying you know, to do our very best because many of us uh, are scientists, but a lot of us are also computer engineers. Uh, they are also uh, software engineers, and what they are doing is to develop all those, all that structure that facilitates the others to do uh, their research. And that means uh, a lot of things, uh, including uh, the, uh, the the data that are. Uh, managed in a way that, that they can be, you know, machine, machine readable, uh, the, the resources in terms of uh, services, um, the, <coughs> uh, the uh, uh, services that are orchestrated into workflows and VRAs, etc. So, 
the period uh, 2017 to 2022 uh, to 2021, actually it was till March 2022, it was our first implementation period. We came up with a, with a plan, with a strategic plan, uh, whose the um, sole aim, the overall aim was to consolidate uh, the resources, to consolidate uh, the um, community. And in order to do that, we tried to develop a very strong, uh, let's say, uh, bulk of the common facilities, with three common facilities, dealing with coordination, the development, and the operation partially of what was there, and also quite a strong uh, network of uh, distributed centers, uh, which were producing and still are producing uh, data sets, uh, web services, and other type of assets for the life of charity. I think that we created uh, also the uh, administrative and the financial infrastructure in order to be able to support our distributed centers. And I have the impression as well that at this point, uh, the dialogue between the common facilities and, and the distributed centers, it's uh, quite dense uh, as appropriate. The first thing uh, was to identify which are our essential ingredients. That stuff, that, that assets, that they, we can't miss them. And I think that uh, these three uh, describe pretty much you know, the essential, uh, the essential uh, ingredients. So not only for LiveWatchEric, but probably for any kind of research infrastructure, but for us, it was the open access, fair data, reproducible analytics, and uh, mobilized communities. Uh, we, we have been spending a lot of effort on this, on all of the three. We think that we have uh, achieved a good level uh, on all of this, but there is a lot, a lot more to be done. And uh, we, are, we are striving to achieve that. Um, we realized that, uh, that the most important challenge, apart from the scientific challenges and the technical challenges, was a cultural one. And that cultural, uh, it, it, it is a change that has to be happened. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, driving the community from working in a solitary, isolated way with uh, most of the time proprietary uh, software and uh, their own data sets and that's that, to something which is uh, a network of brains. Uh, they are having their own collaborative environment. Uh, this last uh, months, uh, we were trying you know, to expand that environment and give them access to the European Open Science Cloud, the EUS, through the EUS Future Project, etc., etc. Our colleague Ron Decker will uh, uh, present the project later on. Um, so, over the last five years, what we did was to create uh, a prototype. And this prototype has some technologies which are cross cutting. For example, uh, we have the Eco Portal, which is the repository of uh, our semantics and the ontologies, the metadata catalog, that's the discovery uh, tool we have uh, that, that works like a kind of a marketplace for our infrastructure, the Tesseract, which includes also uh, Jupyter Notebook and, and uh, uh, probably uh, other type of uh, uh, software that can create DREs and can guarantee the communication between the services and the data. And uh, finally, the light block, which is our SKG, the scientific knowledge graph. And that, uh, as I said uh, yesterday in, in, in some of my interventions, but also my colleague Joaquin Lopez Lerda, uh, this is something that is cross cutting technology. It is based on the blockchain technology. And it guarantees that uh, once the assets are registered in the system, they are monitored, they are connected, and you will see you know, some uh, slides uh, later on to see um, a, a, a few of, of, uh, of um, uh, let's say, the advantages this, uh, this technology brings to LiveLoxetic, and, and uh, somehow uh, it gives you know, a unique attribute. Then, of course, uh, as cross-cutting technologies, uh, we can report on uh, the training opportunity. Uh, opportunity um, in our services. 
Uh, on key scientific issues, uh, we support already a master's uh, curriculum. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of summer schools uh, as libraries are in common facilities, but also in the course of other projects. Uh, we have developed webinars and uh, other educational initiatives, uh, all the way to the primary education, I must tell you. And we are very proud, actually, of this, because uh, this is the message that we have to convey as well to, 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 the, to the young um, students. But all of this, they were just the foundations. We laid the foundations for the infrastructure that LiveWorks has the destiny to build. And uh, we are very well aware of this stage uh, where we are. We are at the foundations and now we are starting you know, to build uh, the, the pillars on which the whole building uh, will uh, construct it around. The vision has changed. It has been a little bit more ambitious. It is to become the research infrastructure providing access to the world's biodiversity content, uh, services, and communities in one click. Can we do it alone? No. But we can do it if we collaborate with other research infrastructures, with the global aggregators like GB, for example, and Nobis, and, and uh, with uh, um, uh, platforms like the EUS platform, which is in the making uh, these years, and therefore we can provide to them a lot of our capabilities, but we can also have access to the capabilities that these infrastructures and infrastructures uh, can, can give you know, to our own community. And I think that uh, uh, the, the chances and the opportunities are unlimited. At least this is how it looks right now. The mission has changed for, uh, for these uh, uh, next five years and it is to accelerate the research effort of the scientific community by delivering the European state-of-the-art infrastructure uh, oh no, that's e-science infrastructure on biodiversity and ecosystem research. You're going to recognize this structure later on in the slides like a, a, a next generation either infrastructure on biodiversity and research and, and ecosystem research. So on with the uh, new era, the new period, we are in the second phase of the implementation period and that starts from 2022 to 2026. Uh, we established, uh, through a dialogue, our main principles as an organization right now, not only as a research infrastructure, but as an organization. And those principles start from the organization capability and process and uh, uh, the values that uh, we are adding to the scientific community, the engagement of the people, and uh, it goes all the way to the stakeholder uh, relationship, the stakeholder management, uh, the communication uh, with a great audience out there, etc. We have plans for this, we have deliverables for this, uh, we have a, a certain way in which we are going to uh, work anyway. And um, uh, later on we have uh, this, uh, this session on the thematic services and through that uh, we will allow you know, a dialogue here uh, how we can uh, go ahead and, and uh, submit, you know, the deliverable, which is uh, by the end of this year, um, and, uh, and make sure that those thematic services are provided the way that the community wants them to be. Of course, we are always open for any um, uh, uh, um, transformation into any kind of form that facilitates the community, but that's possible with the uh, cross-cutting infrastructure uh, we have already built uh, from the previous period. Um, that has uh, provided us uh, with a lot of uh, extra work, uh, but at least uh, right now we are building the cockpit uh, view, uh, which is uh, very important for all of us, the members of the General Assembly, to be aware what is going on at real time, and uh, they may have also the, the key uh, performance indicators on, on any aspect uh, they want or we want. And we defined in this strategic working plan four major priorities. And imagine that this is, you know, a kind of a per diagram, <clears throat> and each of those um, they they correspond, you know, to work packets. So we see LiveWorks as an organization 
We see LightWorks like as an infrastructure, we see LightWorks like as a community, and inside there, uh, there is uh, a lot more energy to be spent on our process to industrialize the technology and to transfer the technology and, and the innovation that is being produced by all of you uh, to where it needs to. And uh, uh, this is also part of, uh, uh, of our uh, uh, plan and, uh, and the first deliverable is due uh, this, uh, this June anyway. And uh, I, I think that the plan itself, it has been produced. That means the industrialization plan. In very simple ways. What is that? That means that we have developed a prototype. And this prototype is at the TRL, the technology readiness level, of six. Now we have to bring it to nine. That means that we have to develop that structure that multiplies the process, that makes sure that the documentation, the quality, and other attributes of uh, all of our infrastructure are kept, and therefore uh, it can work <coughs> Uh, in a way that uh, 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 it will give us, uh, you know, the next slide. Technically, but from the uh, point of view of the design and not nothing else, please do not take this, you know, as, um, uh, as a planning from the technical point of view because it's not like that. It's a conceptual uh, uh, plan. So we start, you know, from the data providers and also access we provide to the integrators, to the observatories, to the uh, global aggregators, as I said, you know, before, and LiveLock uh, uh, helps uh, a lot here. And then uh, we are building uh, the data lake. Actually, the first uh, components of this data lake are in place. Uh, we are going to ask for your help pretty soon. Then there is, uh, excuse me, there is this layer of the vertical composability layer. These are the core services, services like AAI, I'll be there in a minute with you. Uh, services like monitoring, valuation, help desk, etc., etc. These are the services without which our infrastructure and any other infrastructure that is built on the cloud cannot work, cannot operate. On the top of that, we have the horizontal composability layer. Uh, this is about the uh, cross cutting technologies. Uh, we've been presenting, you know, a minute ago the eco portal, and the data catalog, the live blog, the Tesseract, uh, etc. And uh, they make sure that we have already the framework that allows all those resources that are coming in LiveWatch to be collaborating with each other. And that's very important. That's very important because uh, then the user can build by herself, by himself, her or his own workflows. And sometimes, you know, they don't know what is there available for them. And they don't know what are the capabilities of um, using them in combinations that we would, we've never been imagining up to now. And that's very important for us. And we try, and we're still trying, to create this environment uh, to be uh, receptible uh, to, this, to this kind of changes. On the top of that, uh, we have an ecosystem of analytics, and that's uh, the web services. Uh, that, uh, there are over 100 right now, but uh, trust me, in the last year, there has been a, a blast in production of uh, new web services and, and, and new uh, uh, VIPs. Uh, and uh, uh, what is coming is, is uh, something that uh, has not been um, um, repeated in, in the past. On the top of that, uh, we have a layer uh, with the uh, services that convert the results that we get from the analysis to the services into knowledge. Uh, either that means graphs, either that means comparisons uh, or publications, etc., etc., and finally, of course, uh, the users and beneficiaries. Five minutes, I'm getting there and I'm going to uh, call up uh, the people. That's the industrialization process. We have the, as an input, the requirements of the community, the production pipeline, and the output. So we have already designed the production pipeline and we are on the process of implementing it. <clears throat> and now I think uh, uh, after this slide, I, I will give the floor to my colleague. Uh, uh, Antonio Jose uh, Sanz Alvarez. Uh, this is, as, as we said yesterday, uh, the uh, integrated AI we have developed, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty much um, uh, 
uh, interoperable with uh, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, other types of AAI, and uh, we are building the federation of this uh, with the with the EOS these days. Actually, uh, today at four o'clock, I have a meeting. And uh, I will skip those uh, workflows because they have been presented uh, yesterday and I will give the floor to Antonio Jose to speak with a simple language and present the my language and blockchain. Yeah. Hi. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> I'm AJ Saint, I'm the uh, coordinator of the operations of the ICT Code in Lepocheri. And so, um, my pleasure here to uh, show uh, one of the elements that all of us were waiting for for a long is the, how the final users just interact with all the infrastructure, all the services, all the elements in a way that is easy and also uh, available, and so they can manage and integrate and collaborate. So, there are many things here, but more or less, just from the point of view of the users, uh, the user need a way just to engage in the system, start working with them, um, share the information with other uh, users, and also uh, be capable just to be uh, somehow alerted about uh, elements, developments, or some interesting news, not in the in the way of just any news or social media, but news about people just working with them on, in some uh, similar minds. So, uh, that is the idea behind the my language. Uh, the, the idea is just to make really easy for them to interact with the system. So, from the point of view, you can say, okay, that's more or less a, a second portal uh, that you have, okay. But behind that, there are really, really, really a lot of capabilities because you have some capabilities, some uh, areas of interaction where you can have uh, maps, you can have uh, access to virtual research environment, you can have access to um, uh, scientific validated workflows uh, with papers behind, uh, you have lots and lots of resources and also you have ways to uh, ask the system, okay, in my domain, uh, around all the elements I've been working with, which are the other elements that are available, who else is working here? So this is a way just to interact, but behind that there is a lot of services, semantic services, uh, the blockchain, etc., etc., just Providing the information and making it easy for the uh, user to interact. For example, this is a knowledge graph. And in this knowledge graph, you can see people, things, uh, organizations that are related to your domain or your current research. And make it really easy just to contact with them. And that information is just extracted from the information that is public available or the information they are providing just interacted with the system. Here, we can have semantic search that integrate all the searches, not only internally, but also from external providers, sample JP, etc., etc. And we provide all that information in a way that is uh, easy to interact and also with search, semantic search capabilities. And all that context is provided by the system to the user in uh, just getting for the information the user is inter uh, interacting with. For example, this is the services and uh, just searching in JDIF. We have also integrated uh, Zenodo, Elter. We have also our own metadata catalog and we also have the uh, interface with physical. The, and we are working in integrated most services. So it's a unified process. You don't need to go in each different place. Uh, that's the part of uh, the, the 
not only the services that are provided, you have seen the light flow, you have seen the Tessera, but uh, that is the point of view of us, the IT people, the point of view of the user, the final user is how to interact that with all those services, but using their own mental model, the mental model around research. Just to close by saying that the Big Bang is expected 13th of June. This is where our General Assembly is and they are waiting for this. Thank you very much. So, uh, we... <laughs> we only have time for one quick question because at the end of this session we will have a quick survey about the Core services, but uh, we have time to take one question if there is an urgent one. If there is, ah, yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Um, just like uh, curiosity, you know, now there are some people that think that we should move from data lakes to data mesh, distributing the data. Um, do you have any comment on that in, in, in LightWatch? Are you thinking of, on, or do you prefer to keep this idea of data lakes rather than data mesh? Oh, yeah. Can I give the mic to my colleague? Because Thank you. Okay. Um, the architecture of our system is that it's distributed from scratch, completely distributed. So, from our point of view, uh, indeed the data lakes are distributed. And so uh, we can uh, federate additional external services, data lake, whatever you need, and they integrate with each other. And one of the elements that is very important, and uh, I think I think we are the few uh, research uh, infrastructure that provide that is that sometimes you need to move the data, other times you move the algorithms. It's transparent for us. What I know is that lately they talk about data spaces. Great. So, uh, the previous days we heard a lot about EOSC, and today we have the pleasure to have someone who will talk in detail about EOSC. So, my pleasure to welcome uh, Ron Decker from uh, the Technopolis Group, who will uh, give you uh, much information about it. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me in this uh, wonderful city of Seville. It feels almost like a second home. I, I think this once I've been more at Seville than at home. So, but uh, let's let's start on the, this European Open Science Cloud. Uh, before I start, I want to go one step back to open science. Uh, as UNESCO defines it, it is about opening up. It's it's starting with collaboration right from the start with within your discipline, uh, with other uh, science disciplines, but also outside academia. And the second step is also to open up the whole process, to be more transparent. And I think what gets most attention currently is this open access to the outputs of research. So to have access without legal and financial barriers to the results of science. And, but also you can see open science is a kind of umbrella uh, construct. It, it relates to data, to publications, to software, to involvement of, of uh, citizens, the engagement of citizens. Um, so it's, it's an amalgamation of, of items. I will talk about open data, or rather fair data. So make sure your data can be found, can be accessed. You have the legal rights, you have the capability to access, in your case, petabytes of, of data, perhaps. And um, this is where EOS comes in. EOS is a tool, is a service to address this open data idea. And basically, it's, it's a web of research data and related services. So it's not only data, it's tools, it's services. And uh, there is quite some confusion when people talk about EOSC. Do they mean the governments? 
the governance between the member states, the European Commission, and the Association of Users, which have a formal EC partnership, that, that's a formal agreement for cooperation. Do we talk about the many projects that have been going on in Horizon to construct parts of the puzzle, and uh, projects that are still going on in, in Horizon Europe? Um, or do we talk about the ES platform? And this platform is what, uh, what I will talk about now. And it is uh, run in this EOS Future project um, that we are currently running. Uh, two years since now, almost, uh, almost uh, reaching the end in, in September. And it's, it's, yes, it is about technology. It is about building a, a platform, doing the architecture. But it's also about content. Content from the science, content from outside science, from enhanced infrastructures, uh, services uh, on, on computing, on storage, on networks. And it's also engagement. It, it doesn't make sense to have a facility if you don't have any users. And it's about bringing the providers and the users together in this platform. Um, I think the title of the session is Systems of Systems. I, I just want to step out one little bit to, to stress that EOSC is a federated system. So it's not what perhaps some people think to bring all the data together in one place. That, that, that would be sheer impossible anyway. But some people have this in, in mind. It's, it's one place with one click you have all the data. It, it is federated. So it is about bringing together independent uh, systems that have their own policies, that have their own rules, their own culture. But there is a common goal that these systems or organizations agree on, and that's where you build the governance on. It's complex because you don't have the hierarchy you normally have in one organization saying, let's go this way. You have to agree with this whole group of people that are a member of, of this uh, consortium. So now let's go to the EOS Future project. It is um, 41 million, almost 100 beneficiaries, and this has to be done in two and a half years. Um, yeah, which was quite stressful, I, I think, to uh, The time pressure is high, let me state it that way. Um, it is bringing research infrastructures uh, together, different disciplines, but also the e fast the computing, the storage network. It is, uh, uh, the Research Data Alliance is a member, which is 10,000 plus individuals working on technology, on metadata, on all kinds of supporting tools and services for science. Uh, I'm from Technopolis, who we, we coordinate this, this project. Um, it's also about connecting with related project. There has been a lot of Horizon 20, 20 projects doing parts of the puzzle. We uh, incorporate this in, uh, in, in setting up this architecture. And as you can see from the structure, uh, yes, there is a lot of attention for technology, for work packages deal with uh, technical issues. Uh, but you also see the science and you see this work package aimed on on procurement, reaching out to even commercial providers, uh, reaching out to uh, providers that might bring new services. And we, when we started, we didn't even have an idea what could these new services be. We had to ask the researchers, we had to ask the research infrastructures, what would be interesting for you to integrate on this platform? So this is going on. Um, Yes, we have the, the, the training part, we have engagement, which is becoming more and more important as, as the project matures. And we have the connection with, uh, with this, the policy and the strategy people. So reaching out to, uh, to the member states, to the commission, to the EOSC association, other stakeholders. This is in a nutshell the, the project. 
So how does it look like? As I said, it's three main things. It's the technology, it's the content, it's the engagement. And on the right hand side you, you see the simplified structure of, the, of this architecture. At the bottom, what is called EOSCore, you see basic uh, capabilities, basic facilities. It is authentication, it is about providing a help desk. Um, so all kinds of basic services, if you onboard as a provider, you can make use of these services. One level up, you see the interaction. What are the rules for participation? How do you uh, onboard as a provider? What can you do? Uh, how do we do procurement? What are some rules for PID policy? If you join EOS, what will be the consequences? And then you go up to the blue part, which, which is the exchange, which also has uh, what we call horizontal services. So independent of a discipline, it, it can be the computing, the storage, or the traditional ones. It can be new services that are being provided to the users. And then you have the connection to the, to the research communities, which perhaps is better explained in this Again, simplified picture. Uh, you, you can come in by the EOS portal and do a search on the marketplace. There are catalogs behind, behind this, and there is uh, the providers are filling up this, uh, this catalog. But you can also go, I think it's My EOS Life, it, it, it could be an entry. And what we try to do is in the back end, we, we try to connect these catalogs. So even if you enter by my EOS Clive, you, you could end up in the EOS portal because there is data or services that are of interest of you, for you. Um, talking about science and the science project, um, the, all the science clusters, we call them the, the science clusters, so, so uh, EOS, uh, uh, EOS Live, uh, LifeWatch is, is part of EOS Live. Um, they collaborate together and they agree to do joint projects. And that was also a requirement. Do projects, 10 projects in total, that uh, combine disciplines. Uh, we have a number of projects, and, and Christos is leading this work package, a number of projects where environment and life sciences work together, or we, we work together with the, with the social sciences. And what it shows is that it is possible to combine catalogs. It's a lot of work of combining the metadata standards. So there is quite some field work before you can even get started. And we also have, that, that's more on, on the, uh, astronomy and, and the synchrotrons, where they combine with horizontal services like computing, massive storage, uh, to see how you can integrate and make it easier for users. Go on the platform, everything is there, you, you, the data are present, the computing uh, facilities are there, the, the storage is even there. That's the idea behind this, uh, this EOS. And again, we want to stress that it, it, is, it has to be a value added. EOS must be capable of adding value, uh, uh, adding value compared to LifeWatch, for example. You, you have your platform, on top of it, it, it could be the, the EOS platform where you have this cross-disciplinary collaboration, where you have composability, and with this we mean you do a research, you store your results in Zenodo, but it is integrated in the catalog, so people can find it and build on what you have produced. One example, in uh, gravitational waves, the, a group did a study, about one year and a half, to, to do the analysis, to collect the data, etc. It's now in the EOSC, and you can find the recipe, the data, the software, it's there. And you can repeat. I think uh, we, we had a demo. You can, it takes you a couple of days to one week to repeat this research because all the information is there. 
and you can reproduce, but you can also play with the parameters and do your own analysis. And I think this will speed up the way that science will be done, building upon what is already available. And on the onboarding, that is also what, what Chris has mentioned, a research infrastructure can connect to the EOSC and, and it's not of bringing all your information to EOSC, it is about connecting to the EOSC, it is this federated system. So where are we now? Yes, the platform is operational, we, uh, and I will show some pictures in a minute. Um, we have these proof of concept that cross-disciplinary work works, these science projects. Um, and this, this is perhaps for discussion. I see a potential new, yeah, new role coming up, research infrastructures as aggregators. We are now dealing on procurement with the Amazons, with the, with the Microsofts. And it helps if you're uh, not only uh, LifeWatch, but you're on EOSC Live, or you are the five clusters together, or even with the E-Infras dealing, negotiating for storage. Um, and yes, we have training, there is a separate system where you can produce professional videos, um, and we have the focus groups. Uh, we talk with these groups to, to see how we can improve uh, the, this uh, system. Two snapshots. As a provider, you can see how to onboard, how to, uh, you, you get information about your services, uh, how many you use, etc. And you can make a, a connection uh, to outside with API. As a researcher, you can go to the marketplace. It, perhaps it's similar to uh, My Life Watch, where you can browse, you have different types of, uh, of services. And finally, for, for discussion, uh, I don't know for, for here, but I think we need to make the onboarding of providers more easy. Uh, that, that's a detailed technical discussion, um, but I think we, we need this uh, solved. Um, the other one is how to connect with the research com uh, communities. Basically it's saying, is EOS business to business, EOS to LifeWatch, or is it EOS to to the research directly, or a combination of the two. And this is an ongoing discussion, uh, which types of users to, to address. And finally, well, perhaps not finally, a recurrent discussion is the quality of data. How can we ensure the quality of data? And I personally think here the research infrastructures comes in. Because at EOS, yes, we provide a platform, but you need the content, you need the expertise of different disciplines. And perhaps a researcher, if he sees LifeWatch as, as the, the host of the data, it's, it's enough as a quality step. But this, again, is an ongoing discussion. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Time for one short question, and I already invite uh, Stefan de Kaiser, who is our next speaker, to come uh, for the presentation. So, who? And yes, or someone else. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was wondering one particular question in all this system is you know the data providers, and in particular, you know, in, in biodiversity, sometimes producing that kind of data takes a lot of effort. You know, the typical case, a small group that they are very specialized in a particular taxonomy group and they have been collecting for 10 years, you know, time series of, of data. Um, the data governance on that, you know, how to acknowledge them if they provide this data to the whole community. And um, sometimes, you know, they say, okay, I have spent 10 years on my own resources providing this kind of data. Which will be my gain on providing this if later on people can take this, put in an Whatever, and then they publish, and maybe they have, I, I mean, their knowledge. Um, so I think it's important to engage these kind of groups and, and recognize the effort and the expertise somehow. And I think sometimes, at least personally, I miss which will be the, you know, the schema to do that. Yes. Um, yeah, very, very good point, and it, it relates to what I said in the beginning. 
uh, open data, I don't like the term uh, because data sh uh, some data can be cannot be open, but I think the, uh, the owner of the data, the creator of the data, should remain in control. So it's uh, talking about data sovereignty in a, in a way. And you need, you, you can have different stages. I know at, at the half of they have these different stages for the sensitivity of data. You can also say, it's okay to have my data, just it says uh, CC0, just mention my name and that's it. Up to, if you want to use my data, uh, write me an email and I'll see if, if uh, I approve you, that you use the data for this specific project. Up to a scenario where you say it's okay to work on my data, but let's work together. Uh, so I think you need different scenarios. And this is also, I think, de depending on the discipline. Some disciplines, astronomy, they, they, they have all these rules and regulations already. In social sciences, it's, it's totally absent. Thank you. So, Stephanie de Kaiser from the uh, Flanders Marine Institute will talk to us about uh, taxonomy. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Julien. Um, okay. So, um, yes, my name is uh, Stephanie. Uh, I work, uh, I'm, I'm a part of the. Uh, what is it? Sorry. So, um, I'm a part of the data management team of the World Register of Marine Species, or WORMS for short. Uh, and for this presentation, I also have to acknowledge my colleagues of the data management teams of Eurobis and Marine Regions, which I will mention later. So, uh, some of you probably know what a, a LifeWatch species information backbone is, but just a quick uh, refreshment. Uh, so, it builds on expert validated and uh, literature based information. Uh, the idea is that you can uh, facilitate the standardization of species data, that you can facilitate the virtual integration of distributed data repositories, and it's the driving force behind the species information services of the Belgian LifeWatch eLab, which I will also show you later. And it's coordinated by VLIS, so the Flanders Marine Institute, at three parallel levels. So first we, um, we develop uh, the system, so this is setting up the backbone. Uh, on the second level we do the data management, so it's to complete and update the, the contents, both taxonomic and related information, so that's where the data management teams uh, come in. And then the third level is the community support, uh, where we organize and mobilize the experts. So for instance we organize workshops for the WORMS editors. This uh, image is to show you that um, it consists of five big components. So we have first the species registers, which is taxonomy. Then we have species occurrences, which is geography. Uh, we have uh, ecology, which is trait and attribute information. And then also a genetics component. And each piece of information is linked to a source, which makes up the fifth component literature. It's not only for scientists, it's also for policy makers, industrial players, and the civil society that can make use of this backbone. I will not go into detail into this image, it's just, it's just to show you that already a lot of data systems, databases, uh, both inside of this and outside of this, are in one way or another linked to this backbone. Um, I will uh, focus on three of them, so worms, rubies, and uh, marine regions, which are managed at this. So um, worms is one of the biggest contributors at the moment to the, to the backbone. Um, it's the, the core uh, of worms is still taxonom taxonomic data, so it's a species register. But the database behind worms, which is called AFIA, also contains a lot of other information, such as distributions, uh, attributes, traits, information, uh, we have specimens, uh, all linked to a source, and as you can see, this nicely uh, feeds into the, the components of the backbone. Uh, AFIA, the database behind worms, also contains non-marine uh, information, but so worms is like the marine uh, portal uh, to display this marine information. Um, all the information in AFIA can be accessed through web services, so if you go to our website or the link here below, uh, you can see the web services that we currently have for WORMS. Um, 
some uh, perspectives, uh, some new tools. So uh, since two years, uh, the uh, ocean, ocean decades of uh, the UN started. Uh, WORMS is also linked to two programs. One of them is Green Life 2030. So the idea in this program is that we um, make uh, ocean data available, that we see where the gaps in knowledge are, and the slogan is the data we need for the ocean we want. So WORMS is linked to that. Another uh, program that we are linked to quite recently is Challenger 150, which is they, they want to act as an umbrella for all projects related to deep sea research. And so WORMS has a deep sea portal, so that also nicely links to that program. And of course, we hope that in the next eight years, uh, there will be more opportunities uh, to collaborate. Um, quite recently, we uh, uh, launched the tool, the Trades Data Explorer. So here you can, uh, you can see the link and how it looks like. So it's an Archani application and it uh, makes available all the trade and attribute data that we have in, in AFIA and in WORDS. So you can combine trade, you can also combine it with standardized distributions, to, uh, and so you can create a list of uh, species with a specific trait in a specific area, for instance. Uh, some, next steps, some next steps, of course, we want to continue what we are already doing, so that system maintenance, uh, data management, supporting the society, uh, and we also want to collect uh, more essential species trait information. So traits and attributes are already in AFIA, also uh, traits that are relevant for society, like the IUCN Red List, Birds Directive, Habitats Directive, but we want to um, expand that. We also want to focus more on commercially and ecologically relevant species, um, and then the genetic data is also something that we want to focus on more because at the moment it's quite limited within the backbone. So we want to make more links with genetic data resources and also incorporate these established temporary names that are coming from genetic analysis. So um, things like species A, species B, so how can we give that a place in words? Um, there is a publication currently, um, a manuscript being written and the idea is that we publish it this summer. Euromis is a, um, uh, yeah, the European Ocean Biodiversity Information System, so it's occurrence data. So it feeds into the species occurrence component, but it also uh, feeds into the species registers, because names that uh, come into data sets in Euromis that are not in worms, we contact the editors and then we can see if we can add them or not. This scheme is just to show you that Euromis itself is connected to many other data systems. It's also one of the providers to Orbis, which in its turn is a provider to GBIF. Also here we have uh, web services available for Euromis data. And then the next steps is also to include genetic data, so uh, similar to worms, uh, match with BODC, so that we can standardize uh, the extended measurement of facts table of the Darwin core, and then continuous efforts to make the data fair. Marine regions is a bit the, the link between uh, the species registers and the species occurrence uh, components. So marine regions is a standardized gazetteer. It has geo-referenced uh, names of uh, places, marine places, areas. Um, and so um, the distributions in worms and the occurrences in Euromis use marine regions as their standard, basically. Also here, you, we have web services available. But so, I hear you thinking, why are we doing this? So the idea is that we can establish workflows. Here on the left, you have a few questions, uh, like where does a species appear? Uh, which macrobatic species live in the North Sea at a certain depth? Questions like that, normally you would have to go to several databases, you would have collected the data from these databases, link the data and do your analysis. The idea is that we have an, uh, an e-lab available, so you can see here the screenshot, an e-lab where with one click, like Chris has already mentioned, the one click, that you go there, you select a, a lot of web services that collect the data for you, and then um, you have the result, so that is the idea. Um, here, uh, the web, the, so the e-lab with all the web services, so we have taxonomic services like taxon matches with worms, but also other taxonomic registers, we have geographic web services. They are available through the LifeWatch Belgium website, but also through the LifeWatch EDIC website under the thematic uh, services. 
Um, this is just to show you, so it is being used to the backbone. We have uh, several uh, users. These are a few examples of, of the users we have. So for instance, for the scientific users, uh, we have uh, fisheries data initiatives, such as the Global Fishing uh, Watch. They provide um, maps um, where you can see the tracks of commercial fishing vessels, and they use the exclusive economic zones of marine regions as their base layer. Same for uh, the sea around us, they have uh, interactive um, fish catch maps where, where they also used uh, the e exclusive economic zones of many regions. Um, a, a user story of, for policy is the World Ocean Assessment 2. So it was a global initiative uh, involving uh, hundreds of marine scientists where they wanted to know what are the trends in ocean data, where are the knowledge gaps that we have for the ocean, uh, and for their analysis, they used actually three components. So they used the data of worms, of orbis, and of green regions. An industrial uh, user story is uh, BASF, which is uh, the largest chemical uh, producer in the world. So they, in their line of work, they have to um, uh, apply for a lot of patents, which also involves legal issues. For that, they have to uh, collect and analyze biodiversity data, so they have to know where does the species live, in which environment, and for that, they used the uh, data in worms and orbis. And then lastly, uh, we have a story of the civil society. So you probably saw the BBC documentary uh, Blue Planet 2. Uh, it aimed at a poster, uh, and for that poster, they used worms as a source for that. So um, this is my last slide. Uh, so, um, oh, sorry, I it went back. <laughs> this is my last slide. So, Currently, um, a new uh, user story will be going on, which is called MyGraph. So it's towards an interoperable marine knowledge graph. So basically, um, in a nutshell, they, they identified high-value data sets, worms, aerobies, and marine regions, and they want to make the data uh, more uh, interoperable, more uh, machine-readable, so that people can uh, use that data in their own analysis and link it to their data. data. I'm not involved in that myself, but uh, my colleagues can tell you more about that. So, so that's it. Uh, if you want to contact us, we, we have, each have our info address. We are also on Twitter. So thank you very much. So we are well on time, so just time for one question, if there is. If not, uh, we can move to the next speaker, with Katrina Exter, to talk about uh, FAIR principles and why we should use those FAIR principles. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is Katrina Exter. I work at the Open Science team at the Flanders Marine Institute, also known as BLIS. And the Open Science team, our aim is, um, is to bring data management into the 21st century to, to make uh, science um, more open so that it can be found, understood, and used. And we want to back this up with technical solutions that are developed for the creators of the data, so the scientists. Um, but also the users of the data. Now, my title is EOS Fair Data Open Science, but since we had a very good talk about EOS this morning, I'm going to completely skip those slides, save me a little bit of time. Um, and after the presentations of yesterday, I realized that some of the slides at the end, which I was going to skip, I actually want as well, so I'm also going to skip some of the slides in the beginning. <laughs> okay. So first of all, I'm going to start off with some definitions. Most of you will know these already, but I'm going to give them anyway. So open science is about providing unhindered access to scientific results and outputs, to the data, the knowledge, the tools, the publications that are created from publicly funded science. So open science is a movement in the EU and the national level, and it's effectively about return, returning to society what society paid for in the first place, making science accessible by, by anybody. Uh, FAIR is a set of concepts 
um, about making scientific outputs findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and it's basically about making open science practical. There's no point in making your science open if people can't find it, if they can't access it, if they can't work with it, and they can't understand it. So FAIR is about making open science work. Uh, findable, um, science should be just as findable on Google as it is to be able to find Capning or the Eurovision Song Contest winners. You should be able to Google to find a data set or the answer to a scientific question. It's about making science accessible. So once you've found it, you need to be able to access it. You need to be able to get hold of it and download it. Once you've done that, you need to be able to operate on it. You need to be able to open the format. You need to be able to understand what's in it. You need to be able to do something with it. So that's the interoperability. And the reusability is about now that you've found it, you've got it, you're using it, you need to know how you can use it, so the conditions of use, but you also need to know how the data were created or what goes into the software you're using so you know that you can trust it, you can repeat it, and you know how you can use it for your own science. Now, FAIR is something that starts with the creators of the science. Only the scientists who create the data or write the tools know what is in them, can explain them, can describe them, can say how you can use them. So it starts with them, but FAIR is also the responsibility of the, the wider scientific infrastructure. We have to provide the portals and the archives where people, where scientists can make their outputs findable and accessible, and we have to provide the data technologies and the data technologists to create the processes by which the scientists can make their outputs uh, interoperable and reusable, and particularly in a way that doesn't place too many extra burdens on the creators of that science. Um, I'm going to skip the slides because we've gone through EOS already. Um, okay, now to make your scientific outputs as a scientist fair, does require an extra burden on what you're doing at the moment. It does require that you describe your outputs and you make them available in a standardized, formatted way, in a way that's not really done at the present. Um, in the long term, it has benefits, but in the short term, it does place a greater burden on the scientists. So it's fair enough to ask why are these important, right? Now, I don't think I need to convince you guys, right? But if anybody wants you to convince them why you should make your, your, uh, your science um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, as well as open, then I suggest you can give these answers. So the first is the philosophical point of view. We should do it because we should do it. Publicly funded science belongs to the public. It's not your science, it's not your institute's science, it's the public science. Secondly, because science is important. It is so easy to find science disinformation on the web, right? The Flat Earth Society is all over the web, but to find science information is not as easy, and that's something we really should correct. And also because we can, right? The 21st century, we have the World Wide Web for decades. We, we have chat GPT, we have particle intelligence, we have drones on Mars, right? So helping scientists make their spreadsheets findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is not rocket science, right? We have the technologies to do this. We can do it, so we should do it. <coughs> From a practical point of view, um, to satisfy the funders. So most science is funded by the EU or national funder, funding agencies. They need to prove what they've done with the money, so they're going to need you, the science producers, to prove what you have done with the money. Is that like a woman or just a cough? <laughs> oh, sorry, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so, so, in order to prove what you've done, then the good thing is not just to publish your scientific publications, but to also publish your, your data and your tools. And if you want to reach other users, if you want people to find your science, find your tools, then obviously you need to make them open access, and if you want them to be able to understand your data and to be able to use your tools, you should make them fair. For publications, journals, more and more these days require a data statement. Um, uh, they require you to give a DOI to the data set that, that sits behind a particular scientific publication. 
Um, and um, fortunately these days, uh, data and software papers are becoming more and more important within the academic uh, context. The publicity um, institutes, um, but as well individuals who get money to, to create a, a data set, to create a service. Uh, if you want people to use these services, use these data sets, then you need to make them open access, you need to make them findable by putting them on portals such as the EOS. And if you do that, then they'll find them, they'll use them, and then you can prove to the page view that they're useful and that they should continue funding you to support, to continue supporting these services um, and to create new ones. Then from a personal point of view, uh, visibility. If you make your outputs fair, open and fair, then people will find them. And if they find them and use them, then you will get acknowledgement, right? You'll get citations, collaborations, recognition. Um, enabling new science to happen, and I don't think anybody can disagree with the statement that to make more science from new science from old data is a good thing. And then it's a bit of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. As we heard at the presentations yesterday, there are a lot of research projects that require big data sets. Data sets that cover a wider range of geography or parameter space or, or, or time. Data sets are too big for any one person or even any one institute to make. So if I provide my data for you to use, then you should provide your data for me to use. Right. Okay, um, and I'm going to give a brief summary of some of the um, EU funded open and fair projects that I've been involved in. Um, just to give an idea of the scope of, of projects that are ongoing. Um, and for this, I will need to correct my notes because I'm involved in so many projects, I forget which ones do what. Um, so the first one is EOS Life. This is a project that brings together um, 13 life science research infrastructures. Um, to, to um, create an open a digital and collaborative space for the biological and life sciences, biological and medical sciences, and this is a project that's ending this year. Within EOS Life, we have created a number of, of services that will continue after, after EOS Life ends. Workflow Hub, um, a COVID portal, um, a common problems model for biological data, and row crate packaging formats. EOS Life has also benefited a number of smaller research projects to add on or to improve the fairness of, of, of workflows, of databases, of um, technologies. EnvyFair is another project that is coming to the end this year. EnvyFair is um, about connecting the cross-domain research infrastructures that work in the environmental sciences. So marine, biodiversity, atmosphere, and solid earth. Within every fair, we have been each individually um, verifying our services, but in such a way that they can be operated in a cross-domain fashion. So someone from the atmosphere can find and understand some data or some services that are in the marine. And we've been created a, a catalogue of, of, of services that we have put onto the marketplace. EOS Future was discussed in the presentation this morning, so I, I, I don't need to introduce that to you today. Um, the next one is Green Cloud. This is a marine focus um, project. It's an ongoing project. It will continue to the middle of 2026. It aims to produce an open science platform for collaborative marine research to provide discovery and access services for okay, data, tools, and uh, collaborative working platform. Then we have Fairies and Marco Bolo. These are two projects that are just beginning this year. Um, the first one is to create interdomain digital architecture for the um, integrated into environmental data. So the idea is to pull together environmental data projects and uh, make them interoperable just in such a way that they can all work within one virtual research environment. And then Marco Bolo is about um, creating protocols for EVs and EVVs making these, these data that lie underneath them more interoperable and reusable, and creating products that environmental agencies can consume. Now, my final slide is um, a very short story of one, not one data set, in fact, it's one type of data set, um, to explain why making your data fair 
and open access is a good idea. So in the Selma Plus, which is a project that ended last year and is linked to the MBRC, we ran two biodiversity observation networks where we, we went out, we collected samples from the marine environment, water samples, um, and samples from, uh, from sacrament plates that have been placed in the marine in harbors. Um, and these material samples, and in some cases also environmental measurements, were collected by the field scientists and processed by lab, by lab technicians. And from these we got DNA and we got images of the uh, creatures on the sacrament plates. And from the DNA and the images we got species lists and species counts. And all of these data were made um, fair and open access. We published them in a metadata record on UNIS's Integrated Marine Information System. And we, from that metadata record, we linked to the data, which was in an archive, but we also put all the data, organized it in GitHub. And these two data that we organized in GitHub, we organized and we, we, we um, described them, we formatted them in using link to open data formats. JSON is one format that you may, want, you may have heard about, the turtle is another one. And the idea is here is that the data themselves are effectively the spreadsheets, the fields I filled in. Um, but then we came along and then we took these spreadsheets, we added on to it uh, a vocabulary or an ontology. Um, we described what was in the spreadsheets, we basically described what each column was, what each row was, and then we took all these data from, from years and years of, of, of biodiversity observation network, we linked them together, we put them in GitHub, and then they were found. They were found in the first case by this event project called My God, um, without us having to do anything. They didn't even have to ask us anything, right? Because every, these, these data sets, these formats that we provided were self-describing. The data have also been, are being used with, uh, in, with the MyWatch Tesseract, and Justine will give a talk about those particular data um, uh, after, after lunch or before lunch. Um, the data are also being used in the Fairies virtual, virtual research environment, and the data have been used within a project, MetagoFlow, which actually benefited from Google's life funding um, to do sort of analysis. Now, the point is that because we, we took the data that we got from the field scientists, and they didn't have to do anything that was that different from what they did before, they just had to do it in a better way. Because quality control is really important when you're going to make data and machine acceptable and machine uh, op op operatable. Um, but what we did, what we did is we added on the data technology. We, we, we turned these into linked open data, and that meant that they could be found by people and they were used by far more people in far more projects, producing far more science than we would have been able to do, uh, or the seven plus project people would have been able to do. So that's definitely a benefit of making your data open and fair. Thank you. Thank you for that. And yes, you were recorded, and I guess it will be fair uh, to find your presentation online later. Uh, time for one question. Yes? Sometimes we have discussed if, if we need to add another A to the third term, and knowledgeable. Because, you know, um, it, it took you a while you, to make fair this in terms of, you know, that creation. And, and uh, for, uh, well, for some people, they discuss that knowledgeable is as, as important and accessible and interoperable. Do you think that we, we should need to explicitly mention this in, in that term? So, from fair to fair? Or it doesn't matter. The FAIR acronym is mostly um, concentrated on, on basically the actions that you have to do for the machine. I see no reason why not you could add it as, as because it is indeed important. You know, people people work do things if they're being acknowledged. And one of the things we're doing is turning these GitHub pages into sort of mini websites um, and just create a landing page that gives access to the GitHub on which we acknowledge the people who have provided. Uh, the data and, and the technology, um, and so, yeah, I don't see why not. Okay, good. So, uh, I'm sorry, but we need to move to the next speaker, with uh, Jan Rubens, uh, also for the, from the Flanders Marine Institute, and uh, we'll talk about fish tracking.
okay, thank you, good morning everybody. I'll start with showing a picture, which I find a beautiful picture. What you see here, it's not the illumination by night, could have been, but it's just the tracks of people that went for a run in Flanders, where I live. So the, the brighter the color, the more people that go for a run in this area. And I, I, I think it's very inspiring and it, it gives a lot of information. So just showing you this uh, gives a lot of information of, of what people do, where they go. And if, if you have a closer look to it, and I, I zoomed in to the place where I'm living, so the red dot is where I'm living, and actually where the people go for a run, it's, it's where you have some nature. It's where you have a river or where you have a park. Um, so this simple uh, picture just shows us uh, that we like to run in a, a natural environment. Um, so actually, we are all tracking ourselves. We all have our cell phone, and by having our cell phone, we can just generate this type of data. And of course, it would be wonderful to do the same with animals. We track animals. There have been talks uh, these days of people tracking animals and want to know more about their behavior. And uh, so here you just see a couple of animals at all, at, at all uh, tracked. Um, and as long as you're in a terrestrial environment, you might be able to generate these kind of maps as what I just showed for uh, humans. But as soon as we move to the aquatic environment, it becomes much more complicated because GPS doesn't work on the water. So if we want to create these kind of maps, we need to use other technologies. And there's a whole range of technologies we can use. Uh, and depending on the environment where you're working at, you will need one or the other techniques. For instance, in fresh water, uh, many people do use the, uh, the, the radio tel uh, telemetry or, or the, the pit tagging uh, because the radio waves, they still work in fresh water. But as soon as you move to the marine environment, radio telemetry doesn't make sense anymore because the radio waves are not uh, transmission very well in the, in the marine environment. So depending on, on the environment you're working on, we will be using different technologies. And it also depends on the questions at stake, the budget you have available, and, and the area you're working in, how, how, how big the scale is of the... the uh, yeah. Uh, and there has been a fast evolution in, in recent years in these technologies. Um, the very first flat fish ever that had been tracked, which you can see here, it was a place, uh, they used sonar. They used, they put a tag on the fish, which was actually quite big for such a mineral. I think nowadays the ethical committees wouldn't own these type of tags anymore. And then they had to follow the fish for a couple of days with a big vessel, having a lot of people on the vessel, a lot of crew. So you can imagine what it has cost to follow that one fish and to get one track of one individual in the North Sea. Luckily, over time, the technology has evolved a lot, and not only do we now have smaller tags, but we also measure more, they have a, um, a larger battery capacity uh, and more sensors uh, on the tags. Uh, here, for instance, you see an example of something they put on sharks. It's quite big, but of course it's for the big animals as well, where you have integrated several sensors measuring depth, temperature, light levels, but also a camera that you can really see what the other animal is doing, also acceleration to see if they, you have the information of the tail beat, how this is translated in acceleration movements and what it means and, and what type of behavior they are using at that time. So, a large evolution in uh, the technology, um, and actually, we use this technology to answer a couple of questions. We want to know, is, of course, where are the animals going? Uh, as, I, as I showed in my, my first image, is where do we go for a run? Where do the animals go? And how do they move? Uh, how, they, how, do, how do they move? And what are they actually doing? What, what does this acceleration information that we gather mean in relation to their movements, in relation to their behavior? And why are they? moving to specific places. 
So all these questions you can answer using these technologies. And also in Belgium, we use these tracking technologies to know more about the fish behavior. Um, and we use two methods, acoustic telemetry and data storage tags. In acoustic telemetry, you have um, receiving instruments, which you put uh, in, in the area you want to investigate. And then you have some tags you put on the animal. And as the name it says, it's acoustic, so the tag sends out an acoustic signal on a specific frequency, and then uh, if, it, if your animal moves close to one of these receiving instruments, uh, it knows, okay, I recognize that signal, uh, and get a timestamp. Um, and it gives you a timestamp when the animal passed by your uh, receiving instrument. Uh, and each tag is unique, so you can follow each individual. Um, and in Belgium, this is the network we have. So we have over 100 acoustic receivers that we put in different environments. We work in river systems, uh, also in the estuary, and then in the coastal and more offshore areas. So uh, with the network, we have available of this acoustic telemetry, uh, we can cover a broad range of uh, fish species that we can follow. Uh, the other technique is the data storage tags. Um, as it says, it stores the data on the tag. So actually, it has some sensors. Often, what we use is depth and temperature. And on, uh, it, it, it records this information every couple of seconds. So every couple of seconds you have information of what was the depth of my animal and what was the temperature my animal was in. And then based on some, on some modeling, we can um, define the track of where the animal has been. So here you can see, uh, here you can see all the depth information over, over almost uh, yeah, half, uh, almost a year of data, and then also the temperature range it, it has been in. You know where you captured your animal, where you released it, and you also need to get these tags back to get the information. So you know, also know the recapture place. And based on this information, you can then model where your animal has been. I had an animation showing the data over here, of course, it's PDF, so I can't show it here. But you could clearly see that, okay, the animal was released at the estuary uh, in Belgium, and then it moved all the way to the English Channel, stayed here in winter time, and then in spring, it moved back to, to the place where we had captured it, and we recaptured it very close to its original place. So getting, giving us a lot of information of what's ongoing. But it's very interesting to, these, to do these studies. Uh, but it's much more interesting to move towards networks, and that is actually what we are trying to do. So here I show you, um, I started myself over 10 years ago tracking called an offshore wind farm to know the impacts of the wind farm on the behavior of the animal. But during the study, we realized that there's, there's much more than only my study. And, and once the animals left the area, we didn't know what happens. Did they die? Did they go to another place? Were they close by? Did we, we couldn't record them? So then the idea came of, OK, we should have this larger network, which we now have, thanks to oh, the live watch infrastructure we could do in place. Um, but we also already went one step for, further. It's nice that we have this network in Belgium, but many people across Europe are doing the same research. So everything needs to be united in one central system, which is for our case the European Tracking Network. And of course, then we also need to uh, realize that of course we're not alone uh, in Europe and that there are many initiatives across the globe. So we should all interact with all the other uh, systems as well. Um, so I'm moving now a bit to what are the objectives of, of having such a network, uh, both within the LiveWatch framework, but also beyond uh, and on a more um, global scale. So in this, uh, okay, yeah. uh, in the European Tracking Network, actually our aim is that we want to track animals across Europe because we want to better understand 
and protect them uh, and protect and manage them. If we understand what the animals are doing, then of course we have better uh, tools at hand to protect and, and manage the animals. We have several um, objectives on which we aim, but today I want to focus on the, the, the centralization of the data, and that's where the virtual research environment of the European Tracking Network comes in. Um, so we have a central database, um, and then we have a shiny application where you can visualize all the data that's in the central system, and we also have an RStudio server with an R package linked to it, where you can then and go for your in-depth analysis of the data. Um, so a bit of the data flow, so you have your uh, animal that you track, but you also need some project metadata of, of what's the project about, uh, also the, the metadata of the tags, the receivers, um, and that all goes to the central system, which is a Postgres uh, uh, SQL data system, and uh, from the database you can then do your visualizations in our shiny application, or you go to the RStudio environment uh, to do your in-depth analysis. Just some statistics from uh, the, the database as it is for the moment. So we have over 20,000 animal tag animals that are in the system right now from all across Europe. And uh, the, the winners for the moment are the European eel and the, the Atlantic salmon, uh, for which we have for both species three to 4,000 animals in the system. So having such a large number of animals in your system also allows you to tackle questions on, on a higher level. Um, when, when you start with your study and you, you can do something on ELSK in, in a specific river, now you can really go to overall studies across Europe to know, okay, what's the timing of escapement from the rivers for eels in Europe? Is there a difference related to hydrology or temperature regimes or your regional area where you are. So you, you get much better insight on the species as a whole and not only in your study area. Currently we follow um, 126 features linked to 450 projects. We have more than 400 users and uh, we have more than 700 million detections in the system right now and it's, built, it's, it's growing every day. Um, the networks across Europe, just to show you, this is the overall network, and if you zoom in to the North Sea uh, or to the Mediterranean, you see that uh, you get large chances of your animals being tracked on other people's network and gathering much more information. Um, I'll skip this one, and then this is showing you one uh, application, what you can do with this virtual research environment. Uh, so we can generate these maps where we combine the tracking data that we generated with, uh, in this uh, instance, we use the UNIS habitats. Uh, so then you get this information of which habitats do my animals prefer. And then you can also link it to the movement behavior between sites, where there are the core areas and what, which pathways they use for their movements. Um, we're interacting with a lot of organizations and a lot of initiatives, just to give you some uh, ideas here. We're also to Mission Ocean, to the uh, UN Ocean Decade, we collaborate with ICAT, we're in, uh, having talks with OSPAR, how we can contribute to their objectives. We're writing a lot of papers. But of course, if we are a growing community, we also have these growing needs, and I think there is where the thematic core services come in, uh, because we were, here I've, I've been talking about fish tracking, but there's many people tracking other animals, and I think the tools and the services that we need are similar across all people tracking animals. So I, I think this is where LiveWatch Eric comes in again, and where the thematic core services can play a very important role. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening. If you want to know more, we have an, an, a YouTube channel, uh, we have a Twitter account being uh, uh, Aquatic Tracking, and you can also listen to the Live Watch podcasts on Acoustic Telemetry to better understand what we are doing. Thank you.
thank you. So we are only two talks away from the coffee break, and I suggest we ask questions during the coffee break and we move to the next uh, presentation with Salvador Fernandez de Janeiro, uh, also from the Fernandez Money Institute. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. And uh, as uh, my name is Elisa, I'm, I'm not from Belgium. <laughs> I'm actually born and raised here, but I work in the France Money Institute in the data center, uh, same as colleagues before. And um, right now, I'm going to talk about one of the projects. I talk about many of them. I'm going to focus only on one. And this project is called BioOracle. So the first question is, what is BioOracle? So as in the question says, BioOracle is a set of DIS rasters providing geophysical, biotica, biotic, and environmental data for surface and benthic marine realms. So you may be wondering, are we collecting this data? No, we're not collecting this data. What we do is we go to Copernicus Marine Service, we do all this data, we resample to a desired extent, and then we also, uh, we also use the CMIP models, which is the main authority for, uh, for models on climate change, and with this we make predictions for future uh, scenarios of, uh, of these environmental variables. So we we'll not only have like present conditions for temperature, salinity, etc., but we also have uh, future predictions. I will talk more about that in the future. And the nice part of this is that all these uh, data sets are harmonized. So you can use them uh, with your data, and then you can make predictions for the future. And uh, it's uh, easy to do because all of them are harmonized and they're accessible and easy to use. So we have many variables, up to 18 of them, temperature, salinity, sea ice cover, all of these uh, things that can affect uh, principally marine life uh, in their distribution. And this is actually the main use of BioRacco. So the main, the main use of BioRacco, main potential, of course, it can be used for other things, is for a species distribution model and also to make predictions for the future. For example, here we have a quick map of the prediction distribution from uh, the basic species, the lionfish. So, just uh, to summarize where this, when this project uh, went to be part to LifeWatch. So, this started in 2011 as part of, the, of a PhD in the Gate University in Belgium. And it was not, on, not until 2016 when this para, because the person that did it, uh, moved to, to Greece, to the Planning Institute, and then it was uh, started to be funded by LifeWatch. Since then, in 2017, there was a second version that actually was done in partnership with the University of Alga in Portugal, and it was released, and I will talk more about it later. And um, in the moment that we are now, we are going to present the third version, that's what I want to show today here. Um, this one is done also in collaboration with the University of Melbourne at the moment, so it's an international consortium. So in version one, we started having uh, only 13 predictors, we call them environmental variables, we call them predictors. Uh, we only have surface and we only have present data and uh, four calculated values. But then in version two, we, have, we started to have 18 of them, 18 predictors. We also have benthic uh, uh, layers in, uh, on top of the, of the surface ones. Um, we have more calculated values and we have also future predictions. In total, we have, like, as you can see here, we have 700 citations at the moment for the first version because we did a paper after that. We have 400 more than 400 for the second one. And uh, what I'm showing now is what is new now in what I'm doing with the third version of BioRacco. So, some things are the same. So, it's still 18 predictors, it's still super and benthic realms, and it's still present and future predictions, same as the values. But what is new here? We are improving the spatial resolution. So, before we had a up to 5 admin resolution, as you can see here, this is the, this is the island of Tenerife, a dwarf slide from here. And uh, as you can see, it, the, it, the, previous, the, the current version 2, it doesn't have just as well to coastlines and to, uh, in islands especially. And with the new version, of course, this is going to increase the size, and I will talk more about that later, what, how are we tackling that. Uh, it's going to adjust much better to the, to the coastlines and islands because the resolution is much higher, spatial resolution. But not only that, 
also we are increasing the, the temporal resolution. As I mentioned before, we have uh, in version 2, we have present data, we call them present because it's the main uh, from data from up to the year 2015. And then we have, we have also two predictions for the future for, uh, for up until the year 2050 and 2100. And with this, what we're doing, we are expanding this and we are, we are giving layers for 10 different decades. So, two, de two, two decades of what we are now the past. And uh, up eight of them, up to the year 200, uh, 200, uh, 2100, but in, in eight different decades. Also, before we had a different, uh, uh, we had the, the, the CMIP model, uh, report five, that was the, the RCP models that were based mostly on, on emissions of carbon. But now we are moving to a new, uh, to, the, to the latest report of the CMIP, that is the six, and it's, it's, these are the shared uh, socioeconomic pathways. The difference mainly is that these uh, predictions of climate change, of how it changed, it also includes socioeconomic variables, like how societies gonna react to climate change. And uh, before we have four different climate change scenarios, now with this one we are blocked up to this, to up to six uh, climate change scenarios. So of course, this is going to make the, the data set go much bigger. So this is where plant based mining is looking and we have to use new techniques to make this more accessible, easy to use, because the data set of course increased down until now, what we were doing. And this is also a key of the, of the success of BioLaco, is that it is to download. You just go to the website, you click the layer you want, you get an email, you download. You do whatever you want with it. They are normally your tips and they are easy to use. But what we're doing now, in top of, on top of providing this, we are changing the backend of the, of the system. <laughs> so we are moving towards a, an AirDAP server. I don't know if you ever heard of AirDAP. So AirDAP is a data server that, uh, that's going to allow to download subsets of the data set. This is on a packet for the big size that it has. Normally, you are doing research, you are doing research on a part of the world, you don't need to download the whole data set. So you can, you won't, and you have enough bandwidth. Um, but this is going to allow to not do the subset on your own, but if you can do it on the server already and then download it. So it's going to increase the speed of everything much faster. And also, it has many, many more capabilities. So it allows, uh, it allows you to, to get different file types. So before we only offer GOT and ASCII files, but now Erdap, I'm not exactly sure of the number, but it offers up to 20 different file formats, including CSV, Excel, you can get a picture, you can get, uh, of course, GOT again. So this is in a way, it's more interoperable, it's easier to access because like you, if different people have different necessities, so, so you, you may only want to, to get some numbers, so you can get your CSV quickly and get, and get it ready. Or, of course, you can get us NetCDF, which is our new file, the, the new file format we are using natively, which is uh, it's the, the main file format that, uh, that's used for multidimensional data. As in this case, we do you saw, we have that longitude, we have time but dimension, we also have uh, climate change scenarios as a dimension. So this is a data that increased a lot, and now it's going to be much easier to access it. But not only uh, it's a, it, access a, it offers a data access form, but it also uh, it also <coughs> includes a REST API, and also if this is uh, this is a system that is kind of standard, so there are already R packages, some Python packages that allow you to download things directly from our app server. So on top of that, we're going to develop two quick clients in Python and R. Before we have a, a package that is widely used, it's called Everything Predictors in R. Um, now we're going to move to a new package, or maybe we'll combine, we need to discuss that. But also we're going to include a new package in Python. And um, both of them are going to do the same. They're going to allow to download things, they're going to allow to catch, and uh, yeah, and download the system. Uh, the last thing we're going to do. This is not going to stay all here, but we, in the Talma Institute, we are also collaborating uh, with a new project editor, Digital Twin of the Ocean. So, that Biodacle is going to, of course, flow to that uh, project. But also, we have been in contact uh, with the Microsoft Planetary Computer and the Google uh, people. And uh, they're interested in hosting also Biodacle, so we will also make sure that it flows uh, up to these systems. And of course, uh, probably will also flow to, to the Lightwatch, like, Select, and so on and so on. 
And that's it. Uh, before I said uh, we'll be releasing in, in June 2023, but uh, now I will be going more conservative. I put summer. I'm not sure if it's going to happen next month. And uh, yeah, you have there about email and um, the website. Um, you know, so the people involved in release, but also uh, the University of Algarve is very important. They are producing the, the models. And the University of Melbourne is helping out with the publication. And we have the scientific advice of the University of Penn. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, I will also move directly to the next presenter, who is Juan Delgada, who will talk about uh, marine biodiversity monitoring for Europe. Hi, I am. Can you get me? Yeah. I am from Colorado. I am from the University of uh, Cardiff, and uh, I am a bit excited here because uh, if some of all the great communications we have this morning about the uh, uh, system of uh, information, we are precisely looking for that. No? Uh, we are an initiative uh, called Empower Europe. It's about marine biodiversity uh, networking for monitoring in Europe. And this is a, a project that has started uh, within Euromarine. I will talk, talk about, a bit, uh, about Euromarine. It's a long time working group coordinated by uh, Marcos Pedro from the University of Northern Norway. And why do we have uh, this long term working group? Within Euromarine, we have two long term working groups. This is one, the other one is about the Ocean decade and climate change. And it's obvious that uh, we need a time series of data to detect trends in marine biodiversity, to know the effects of this climate change, and uh, to know the losses, recovery, and restoration of marine life. Uh, why now? Uh, because there is not a, an European scale coordination of marine biodiversity monitoring. Um, many times, despite decades of efforts on the course action, EU funded projects, uh, we don't know exactly what, where, or when biodiversity is being monitored. So, uh, there is an urgency of need of data due to the crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change. Uh, uh, this uh, project, this initiative uh, starts from Euromarine. Because why Euromarine? Because uh, uh, it's a, an established uh, community to provide continuity of networking in marine science. After the end of short term research projects, you know that the projects can be three, four years, but in the end the projects finish and everything ends. Uh, it is a legally constituted one government organization and has an established community and responsibility to improve scientific practices. Uh, well, what is Euromarine? I am working, I'm talking about Euromarine. Euromarine has uh, the origins a long time ago with FP6, with Network of Excellence, and uh, has the first uh, network time in uh, FP7 preparatory project. And Actually, it starts on 2014, uh, like a network of uh, 40 members of 19 countries, and we are close to 10 years. Uh, so, right now we are 49 full members and 8 invited members from other countries, and our mission is to support the identification and initial development of important emerging topics or issues, or associated methodologies, marine science, science, sciences as well, to foster new services relevant to the marine scientific community. So uh, we make uh, networking at uh, multidisciplinary, international, uh, and play an important role creating and facilitating funding, training, networking, and other opportunities. Uh, here we have the Europe map, where we are now in, in Europe, and this is what you know all the logos of all the institutions.
institutions, universities, research centers, uh, we do have. Uh, along these eight years, more than 5,000 people have get an advantage of the activities. Uh, we have uh, done 68 uh, foresight workshops, uh, uh, 12 working groups, etc., individual fellowships, and we have been involved and we have funded uh, more than a one and a half million euros that comes from the funds of, of the members. Uh, so, what is new with respect uh, uh, to other initiatives uh, we do have? We have a, a, the organization that are signing a mode of agreement or committing to first marine biodiversity monitoring, collaborating, collaborating to improve methods, and third, to publish the data, and the formation of a network of organizations doing the biodiversity monitoring with their own resources. This is sustainable because we think that uh, many of uh, our institutions already done, uh, already do the, uh, the sampling, already do the monitoring of biodiversity, so uh, we can soon all this uh, effort uh, in time. Uh, Right now, our progress, we have been endorsed by AMBO, the International AMBO, as a European component of uh, AMBO globally. And obviously, here we have a lot of interest and support from LifeWatch in, in regarding data management. We, we have needs about data management. Also, interest from, for example, Hermann Biology to help a global. A goal, sorry, uh, to launch a similar initiative. We have applied for UNESCO for recognition as an action within the same decade. And we have uh, this mode of agreement signed by some Euromarine institutions. And obviously, we are open to other institutions. It, it is important to remark that also the initiative starts from Euromarine is open to anyone, and it's not closed. Uh, within the members of Euromarine, perhaps can be a way that other institutions can do uh, Euromarine. So, uh, this is actually a, a new group. We have three, four months working now. Um, the next step is uh, to collate all the metadata about monitoring of marine biodiversity has been done by Euromarine members, where, when, what habitats and taxa we are sampling, uh, see what additional monitoring is being done by others, uh, what time series are published, and, and finally, for next year, we want to write a paper since the basis of the above findings of, on that. And thank you very much. I am open to any comments. Already on time, so we have time for one quick question. You, you deserved it. <laughs> yes. So, so how, how much heterogeneity is there in the way that people are sampling and collecting data? Is it because we talked about FED, but the interoperable parts? Is not, a, is not an asset of data, but is an asset of the system as a whole in order to make it useful for others as well. So is that a problem in the marine world, or is it solved, or...? Well, uh, the, the, the question is open on fair data is... Uh, or, or we have been discussing this morning about this, this problem, but uh, perhaps uh, in terms of uh, marine biodiversity, uh, I guess this data can be sensible, obviously, but. Uh, I think the, the marine community could be open to, to share this data and, and to work with. Perhaps uh, we, we will have a, we need to have a metadata of what we are doing uh, within Euromarine and outside Euromarine in European waters. And our intention is uh, to be the focus of uh, European marine biodiversity in this network of Enbon. Actually. Uh, Mark informed uh, me two days ago that we have just uh, joined the 
Jadi saya akan European proposal is Europe bomb uh, that will finish, I, I guess, in one two years. And we have joined this proposal in, in order to, to, to sum efforts in this sense. Thank you very much. So, uh, in the last five minutes remaining, uh, we will have a quick survey about the uh, technical course services of LifeWatch. Uh, as Professor Bassett mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of this session, uh, there will be uh, different uh, uh, workshops on, on this uh, organized by the national nodes. But uh, we have a quick survey to, to know how much you know about those uh, thematic course services and uh, what you expect, what you would expect from, from them. So I, I give the floor to uh, Leonard Skippers, also from uh, Flanders Marine Institute, uh, to, to draw this quick survey and then we have to copy it. Yes, just to spark some ideas and some inspiration, you can go to slider.com or uh, just scan the QR code. I will wait for 30 seconds and then we will start uh, the questions. So if, uh, is everybody ready? Please raise your hand if you're still busy. So first, you can still see the QR code and the Number two, after and the first question is: Do you know which thematic services LifeWatch is working on? So you can indicate uh, which one that you think uh, LifeWatch is working on. And the idea of these thematic core services is really to bring together the community because collabor collaboration, as you've seen in the previous uh, presentations. Uh, foster uh, more uh, science. Um, I think life edge is perfectly uh, fit to do this on a European scale or even beyond. Okay, thank you all for um, filling this in. So we'll go to the next question. So based on your own research activities, which thematic services would be most crucial for you? So this is really for you or your colleagues, what would you be most interested to, to join? Uh, which thematic session is most relevant for you? We see quite even distribution, which is nice. That means that all of them of the proposed services are important. That is perfect. <coughs> so I think this is an open question. What specific research or policy questions to ask or analysis would you like to be to see tackled by the life or systematic services? I think this is an open question, so you can put a question there. What would you like to see that LifeWatch is doing, or what should the thematic services uh, do for you?
So this is the last question. So I would say um, I will leave it open. You can still think about it. And thank you for participating. And enjoy the coffee break. Thank you. So the coffee break uh, will last until uh, eleven thirty. So thank you for being back here for the start of the next session and uh, enjoy the coffee break. And We're going to continue with the presentation on biodiversity observation system of systems. I just remind the speakers that you have 12 minutes for your presentation and 3 minutes for questions. Uh, our first speaker is Jessica Titochi of the National Research Council of Italy and she's going to present us functional traits of Bowery, sharing and reusing knowledge through semantic resources. Jessica, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sara. Thank you for the introduction. So, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, functional traits and functional trait approaches have become very popular in, uh, um, in ecology, especially in biodiversity and ecosystem studies. With traits, we actually assist to a shift in perspective um, in studying, measuring, evaluating, and quantifying biodiversity. Indeed, we move from a central uh, taxonomic approach that was mainly focused on monitoring the species occurrences, distribution and diversity, to an approach that was mainly focused on the investigation of the functional role of organisms in the ecosystems. So by decoupling uh, from species identity alone, uh, traits actually allow a more generalization uh, and also promote uh, integration of data across uh, different scales, spatial, temporal scales, but also organizational scales. That's why um, researchers have started to focus on functional traits uh, and uh, specifically describing and documenting key traits, uh, their spatial distribution of trait species, uh, and also understanding the relationship between traits and the environment uh, through laboratory, but also uh, in situ monitoring uh, literature review that has allowed a huge amount of uh, trait data that has been produced and collected in uh, trait data sets and trait databases. And of course, then researchers started to uh, use this trace data to explain uh, how trait variate, vary and uh, adapt, and also the trait dynamics in order also to predict the trait responses to environmental changes and biodiversity loss. And also to understand and investigate how biodiversity loss and consequences of trait loss um, can impact ecosystem functioning and processes. But what are traits and functional traits, and actually how ecologists define and use these terms? So we usually refer to traits and functional traits following the definition of Viola and McDill, that are the first definition about traits. Um, and uh, uh, usually we uh, consider a trait as a well-defined, measurable property of an organism uh, that is usually measured at the individual level. And as a functional trait, any trait that can be morphological, but also physiological, phenological, or behavioral, characteristic of the organism that actually influence its performance and fitness. Um, although this uh, um, definition are very distinct, uh, uh, from uh, 2022, from this review article, uh, Samantha Dawson and their colleague actually uh, showed how nowadays research use these terms uh, in a very interchangeable way. And there is not so much anymore this uh, distinction between them. And um, they, this, uh, in this article, they actually uh, made a deep analysis on the use of traits and trait-related terminologies, uh, conducting both a survey and also a revision of most, uh, on more than 700 papers. And um, what they actually uh, find out is that um, there is uh, a certain kind of disagreement uh, between uh, the classical trait definition. So nowadays, actually, researchers are trying to change and adapt trait terminologies um, 
in response to their data and their ec ecological study that they conduct. And um, they also show that there is a huge inconsistency in uh, not only in the use of trade terminologies, but also in the understanding of trade terminologies. Um, and uh, of course, this hampers the, um, the, the possibility to clearly define traits, uh, and uh, this can also lead to not only uh, difficulties in uh, data interoperability and data integra integration, but also can lead to ambiguous uh, data interpretation. That's why, although uh, a huge amount of trade data have been collected so far, uh, we are still very distant to achieve uh, the uh, fair trade data. Uh, this is mainly due not only uh, for problem of data discoverability and accessibility, but one of the foremost challenges is actually the data interoperability. Uh, and the data inter and trade data interoperability is actually uh, um, uh, it's actually a key issue due uh, mainly to a lack of structural and semantic interoperability. With the structural interoperability, we refer to the data format and data structure with which the data have been collected and shared. And with the semantic interoperability, we actually refer to a lack of a lack and a lack of use of uh, uh, standard terminologies for traits. And uh, also uh, for control vocabulary, thesauri, and ontology. This, of course, hamper not only the data integration, but also the data process and analysis, also through API, web services, virtual research environment, and workflow. That's why uh, to try to overcome such barrier uh, within uh, uh, LifeWatch Italy has launched a few years ago an initiative to develop and promote um, semantic resources based on functional traits. So today I would like to present you the functional trait thesauri that have been uh, developed and uh, published within LifeWatch Italy in the portal. And uh, uh, a thesaurus is basically a control and structure of vocabularies in which concepts are organized so that the relationship between them are made explicit. It's a tool that uh, tries to avoid uh, terminology ambiguity and heterogeneity. And uh, uh, it's uh, usually a collaborative effort and it's an iterative process. Uh, that starts with uh, the term research and selection phase where editor that actually are domain experts, try to determine the scope of the thesaurus and then start to identify the sources and gather the terms. Uh, subsequently, there is a deformalization phase where the editors start collaborating with the ICT uh, people to identify the best structure and adopt the data model to uh, really create a, a structured uh, organization of terms with their definitions properties, but also their uh, uh, relationship. And uh, um, the functional trait thesaurus that have been developed within Life Watch Italy and use uh, this COS, uh, simple uh, uh, knowledge organization system model, that actually works like that. So we have a, a sing every single concept can be defined by different properties. It has a preferential label, but can have also an alternative label that usually could be a synonym or an acronym for that term. And then we have a definition, we could have a scope note uh, where we could uh, uh, include references, bibliography for that trait. And then of course, uh, between two traits, the trait can be associated through uh, hierarchical or as, um, uh, associative relationship. So a term can have a broad, can have a broader or a narrower term, uh, but also related term. And of course, there are also the mapping relation within this SCOS model that allow actually to uh, link uh, this concept with also uh, concepts that are present in different schemes or different already existing uh, semantic resources. And uh, this can uh, happen through a close match, through relationship, relations of close, exact, or related match depending on the similarities between terms. And then there is uh, the editing and validation phase where actually editors, ICT, and this time also validators can uh, choose to get the editing tool and review and validate the terms. In this case, uh, 
Uh, we use a Bombatch that is a very user-friendly uh, platform, that uh, uh, tool that allow um, uh, users to edit, modify concept, also the lead concept. Um, and this, of course, uh, the editors can do this step and then validators can accept or reject the modification. And this uh, story go on till we don't reach a, a stable version of the thesaurus. I forgot to mention a very important thing is that the thesaurus in each concept, concept is identified by a URI, a unique resource identifier, and this is the uh, fundamental key that allows linked open data um, use the, these terminologies for metadata mapping, uh, semantic annotation, and so on. And URI also track the version history of, the, of that uh, trait, if the trait change, uh, for example. Uh, during time. And of course, this led also to human readable, machine readable, and discoverable all these resources. And then there is the publication phase. So, uh, the functional trait is how we, uh, developed uh, by Life for Italy are uh, deposited in uh, Life for Cheric in EcoPortal, that is the Life for Cheric repository of semantic resources that specifically focus on ecology and related domain. And at the moment, we have the fish traits, macroalgae traits, phytoplankton traits, and zooplankton traits, the sauri, with all these traits. Um, we are working uh, on uh, actually uh, implementing the content of this thesauri and specifically include the more definition, more terms, specifically for behavioral, uh, life history, and physiological traits. And of course, we are also working on uh, reorganizing the structure because. Uh, we realize that actually at the moment we have this thesauri as a separate and uh, they are independent, but actually we would like to combine all of them in a unique structure that will be at the end a functional trait thesaurus that will include all these different thesauri as a different schemes. And uh, this process we are always doing it through Bob Batch, this uh, editing tool and very user-friendly platform. Uh, but of course, this is not the only initiative about traits and trait terminologies. This is just an overview of all uh, uh, the work that has been done so far and all the uh, semantic resources that exist uh, for traits. Um, th those are uh, all, uh, this is just an overview, but they are not all with the same degree of maturity and interoperability. We have a simple list of terms of glossary that actually are very useful to uh, obtain definition and information about uh, that concept. But uh, without a URI, they cannot be retrievable by API, by uh, machines. So uh, this should be implemented in this sense. And then we have thesauri and ontologies that actually solve this problem. And uh, within them, we actually uh, uh, have recognized that there are several uh, overlapping or similar similarities. Uh, usually we figure out that there are several terms that uh, can have maybe same definition or slightly different definition, but maybe they are called in a different way or they refer to different, uh, uh, they have different synonyms. So the, uh, the big challenge uh, at the moment and uh, the future perspective that we have is actually the implement to implement the mapping and the alignment between our resources and the, the uh, already other existing resources. And in particular, we are already collaborating in uh, uh, through the ontology alignment. Please conclude. Yes, I, this is the last slide. Uh, through the ontology alignment evaluation initiative to uh, try to, to align our resources, so the future, the functional trait thesaurus within uh, the ecological trait data from GP, uh, GF Bioterminology Service. And we are, of course, also um, aiming to have also new and future collaboration because we strongly believe that the collaboration is uh, the essential key to actually achieve uh, a global consensus of uh, trait terminologies uh, uh, to, to find out also an harmonization about trait terminologies and their use. And with this, I would like to conclude, uh, and I would like to thank you all the team of Life for Cheat, Ali, that worked with me. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, floor is open for questions. Yeah, yeah.
Yes, thank you. I, I was wondering, uh, I know the TRI database a little bit, and it was fairly closed. So has that changed now, or is it completely open and usable, also machine readable? Or? Uh, not yet. They are starting to include uh, some um, uh, URI, but not for all the concepts, uh, but uh, they are in the process to... And the other question is, is it, so the, this is very useful and necessary work, of course, but are you already in a phase that these elements can be integrated in a workflow for, for uh, in a VOE context? Yes, yes. So actually the phytoplankton uh, trait thesaurus is already included in the phytoplankton research environment of Lifocheric and it helps uh, for uh, the in data aggregation and uh, from different data sets. Uh, and uh, later on my colleague will uh, also show you another uh, development uh, for the use of this thesauri, that is the semantic platform, that uh, really actually help uh, in uh, uh, use this thesauri and all these semantic resources for uh, improve that integration and that uh, analysis and process. Um, thank you, Jessica. Uh, pretty impressive work. Um, and uh, it, it will help a lot, you know, to be a uh, search uh, engine through the mylanguage.eu, etc., etc. There we have a federated uh, search uh, function, and therefore it can be built, you know, on the fly. And th this is where uh, your your work uh, comes, you know, as very much important. Um, within our uh, involvement in bicycle project, uh, we came into contact with the uh, with the cities in in Switzerland. Do you know these guys? Because uh, they, they, they are developing quite a lot of uh, useful things, okay. mostly on terrestrial taxa, and yes. therefore uh, probably you should uh, you should contact them. And yes, yes. This is actually uh, the aim. I, I was actually very, very happy to participate to this conference, also to get and improve and expand the network, because at the moment we are really focused on aquatic organisms, but the idea is also <coughs> to, uh, with this the change of the schema of the structure of the thesaurus, we can actually add several schemes about uh, other organism uh, functional traits. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now the next speaker is Martina Pulieri from the University of Salento. She's going to present us building up, building up collective knowledge through semantics. Martina, hello. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going straight forward to the point. So as uh, we see in these days, uh, biodiversity in the ecosystem domain is turning into a data-intensive discipline with high data variability in both structures and semantics. So for structure, we mean the data standards and how uh, we organize our data in our tables. And for semantics, we mean uh, the, the meaning of the data, so which type of data we are dealing with. So we deal, we deal with the trait data, with the abundance data, with behavioral data, uh, and, uh, and so on. And of course, uh, this represents uh, a challenge for data discovery and data integration because of the heterogeneity of uh, the, the discipline itself. And with this in mind, uh, Life Watch Italy has developed... Uh, okay, no, first of all, uh, I want to tell you that a uh, few approaches have been developed in the last decade, and one of these is the semantic approach. Now I'm going to show you a theoretical approach developed by Michelin and Jones in 2012. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there are two datasets that have uh, two population count of uh, uh, salmon uh, population, and they uh, are uh, annotated against an ontology. Because of uh, the nature of the ontology, uh, this uh, model is able to uh, recognize the two types of data and is able to integrate them. So the semantic approach is formally annotating data with semantic uh, resources and uh, to specify the meaning of data. And this can reveal a relationship uh, between these uh, data and makes them easy to understand. Of course, ontology and in general semantic resources can foster uh, unit conversion, alignment, and concatenation of semantically compatible variables. 
With this in mind, like for Italy, has developed uh, the first version of the semantic platform, with which uh, a researcher can uh, search, access the uh, like Italy resources with the help of semantically enriched queries. So now let me show you a little bit how the platform works. Okay, not working. Okay. So first of all, we have at the bottom an, an ETL process, uh, which is going to extract uh, uh, data and metadata from uh, the data portal, data refugee the data portal, and the metadata catalog. And uh, these resources are going to push down in the ETL pipeline. Uh, first of all, these data are normalized into XML, and then are transformed into RDF. These resources are now the uploaded, loaded into uh, the um, triple store graph database. Now this data can be uh, fed to the semantic model. The semantic model is actually a combination of different ontologies. Uh, we have uh, the Lifecell Cell ontologies, which defines uh, the core set of Lifecell uh, Eric elements and describes the high level arrangement. Uh, then we have the scientific observation model, which is an ontology for integrating metadata and uh, uh, scientific observation and measurements. Then we have the digital provenance ontologies, which is an ontology which uh, that describes uh, the process and the concept, uh, uh, the context condition of the digital resource. Uh, then we have the CDOC uh, concept, uh, conceptual reference model, which is an ontology, uh, ontology with formal description that allows the integration of this data. And then we have uh, uh, the partners ontologies, which is devoted to the uh, description of the infrastructures. Uh, these uh, ontologies are then uh, connected to uh, customer relationships that were built uh, uh, for uh, the platform. So now I'm going to show you a little bit to what the platform can do. Um, first of all, uh, annotation. Of course, data are already annotated by the model, so uh, you will find the annotation uh, beside uh, the data. But if you want to change this annotation, you can do it. And uh, uh, the uh, semantic resources come, uh, comes, of course, from Echo Portal. Uh, of course, your annotation will be flagged uh, inside the platform. And uh, this kind of annotation can be done by domain experts. Then let's uh, move to what a simple researcher can do. Uh, it can do mainly uh, two types of search. We have the simple search, uh, and there are two types of, si of simple search. We have a more punctual search, so if you know which, which kind of resources you uh, want to search for, you just type the name of it and the, the, the platform will give you the results. Otherwise, uh, you can type, uh, you can do a more general search, so you just type uh, a, key, um, a keyword. So all the resources containing the keyword is going to uh, be shown. And uh, uh, as you can see here, there, there is also the annotation beside, so you know which type of resources it is. It. Then we can move to the, okay, the structure search. So the structure search is uh, it's very uh, easy to perform. Uh, you can search for dataset, services, person, organization, theory, and observation. Uh, here I'm going to show you two examples of how it works. So let's start with observation. So when you first click on observation, you will uh, this um, uh, user interface is going to be shown. So you can search for observation within datasets, uh, for taxonomic classification, for place, for person that has uh, performed that observation. Or you can search for datasets and it works in a similar way. So you can search it for, for example, geographic description, for techniques, for observation, for taxon, etc. So uh, I performed two, uh, two queries uh, as an example. Okay, so uh, it's not very uh, clear here, uh, but uh, here I searched for an observation which has phenom. Arthropoda, 
and the platform was able to found uh, nearly 80,000 matches. I want to point out that these observations that you see here are single observations within a data set. And this is possible because of the semantic model. So, uh, in the left, you see a bunch of uh, filters with which you can uh, further uh, filter your search. So, I added a filter from Dilewit, and uh, the matches now are narrowed down to nearly uh, uh, 50,000. Uh, so, I, uh, I added a strong weight between 0 and 125. So, again, these are single observations inside each data set. Here, the goal uh, the future implementation, of course, uh, is to integrate this data as uh, a table, so you can download uh, this uh, data as a CSV. And this is actually a limitation for now because of the semantic model that we have. Uh, you can navigate uh, inside the, the, uh, um, the single observation and uh, uh, here you can see all the metadata and the related data uh, of the observation. Uh, now I'm going to show you the dataset one. So I've searched for dataset created during the, the date 2010 and 2020. And again, a bunch of datasets are here shown. Uh, again, here we wanted to integrate stuff. So uh, this is a further step that we want to develop. But uh, if you want just to uh, see the data sets, you can click on one and you see all the metadata again um, annotated on the, on the right and all the information of the data sets. And uh, you, you will also see uh, the attribute table with the label, uh, definition and description. If you have more expertise, of course, you can also perform sample queries. Uh, that will give you this, the same exact results uh, of the structure search. You can uh, type the query directly on the box, uh, or you can uh, uh, create your own uh, query template, uh, so the user of the platform can use your, your template, or you can import uh, another existing template inside the platform. So to wrap up, uh, of course, this is a work in progress. We still have to uh, implement uh, a bunch of functionality inside the platform. And for sure, we have to improve the semantic model in order to better grasp of the present knowledge, of the facets of the, of the present knowledge. And uh, a future implementation that has to be done is to perform the data harvesting from uh, distributed data centers. Because for now, it has been done mainly on uh, or just in uh, the Lefford Citadel data portal and on the metadata catalog. So, this is for me. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martina. The floor is open for questions and comments. Beatrice Sebaish, University of Amsterdam. Um, you said that it was a limitation that currently you could export your search results as a CSV. What would be the, the, the future of the limitation? So what would be the solution? Uh, this is the issue of the semantic model first, because we have to integrate uh, better the results that we have. Uh, we tried uh, different uh, the things, uh, but we're still implementing it, so it's a work in progress. <laughs> Do you also have this ontology and semantics for uh, maps, like for uh, habitat maps or ecosystem maps and, and, and all those categories? Or is it only for species? Um, it depends on the data set that we have at the moment. But, uh, okay, let me... <laughs> so at the, mo at the moment, uh, we have only species uh, in general ecosystem type. But it's possible to integrate also habitat mapping because the model is very general. It's a model that can integrate the information by different domain. But the only problem is related with the 
specific observation because uh, at the moment we use a model that uh, is not very good and uh, we want to integrate a new model that was created from uh, the Research Data Alliance group uh, I adopt. Uh, is a, a ontology model specific for each observation. So in the future, we think that we can more improve the platform and also the extraction of the data because the result of semantic platform is to have a new data set with data that are distributed, annotated, integrated and harmonized. Uh, hi, uh, what is the code uh, that you use for implementation or the code inside is its component? Uh, it's uh, in a uh, HL process, uh, the, code, uh, uh, the, the code of the platform, the, uh, the platform was developed, the language, the language of the platform. <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> Thank you very much. We need to move to our next speaker on the program, uh, who is Andrea Grallo from the National Research Council of Italy, and he's going to talk us about data mobilization in the cost section for Aqua. Andrea, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so um, yes, indeed I'm going to talk about data mobilization in this project called Arapa, of course also on behalf of my um, uh, colleagues and co-authors co that um, uh, collude with me the group one of the project. So let's first clarify what I intend for data mobilization. Data mobilization is a portion of the uh, data management and cycles that basically go from the processing of the data uh, up to the preservation and to give access to, to the data. And it involves all of, uh, these um, uh, steps, uh, such as digitize, check, validate, clean, and etc. And we, in Life which Italy, we do have, we do maintain a data uh, repository. So we, uh, uh, we uh, a big part of our work is actually to, uh, to do data mobilization, so basically to move the data from the lab of the research to our data port. So what's the problem? Uh, is that most of the time the, the data management lifecycle for the search is not really how we think it is. Uh, I have to acknowledge that things are improving in the last uh, years, and I'm sure that this is not the case for people that are here in this room today. Uh, but most of the time, the, the, the process is all around the submission of the paper, and people doesn't really care much about uh, the proper preservation of the data. So what's the problem here? Is that we arrive at, at the end of this process uh, we, without, you know, um, uh, we cannot do too much to fix what happened before. Uh, this is especially true for uh, old data, and uh, we can only adapt to the situation that even if it looks really a bit, a bit compromised. The, the additional problem here is that we don't uh, only want to mobilize data as the generalist repositories do, this is just an example, but we want the data to be interoperable, okay? So this may probably partially explain these huge differences in the data set mobilized. Um, the generalists do quite well uh, but of course, they don't care too much about the data interoperability. So, a few uh, words about the project that, of course, paid my trip here. Uh, so, I have to talk about it. Uh, Parapa is a cost action. Uh, this is a particular uh, type of project because it doesn't fund scientific activities, but the ne networking activities around a scientific topic. Uh, so, things such as meetings, training schools, and Etc. Um, so um, people are always free to take part to this action. Um, if, if 
you want to do it, if you're interested, here is the link to the website, you find all the information. Uh, what is the project about is to, is, um, to organize a network of um, researchers from the academy and from companies around the topic of uh, aquatic diasporic parasites. So what are those, oops, sorry, what are those parasites? Um, they are um, uh, parasites of aquatic algae who produce uh, motile spores. Okay, this is why it's all sporic, of course. They have an important ecological role because they can cause frequent, uh, frequent epidemics in natural ecosystems. They can influence the pantonic succession and can regulate the genetic diversity and also promote the uh, transfer of energy of nutrients to higher level. But they are also important biological constraints in industrial algae production because they can be cut down of by 50% in just a few hours, uh, 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 industrial production of algae, and also the uh, managing of this problem uh, is not really satisfactory because it is usually done by the uh, uh, chemical uh, disinfection of the reactors and uh, reinitiating the culture from scratch. So one of the, the objectives of the project is to uh, bring together information uh, and experiences from uh, different uh, uh, communities to uh, build this uh, online tool that uh, researchers from academy and from companies uh, can be used to uh, um, have a near detection and, and from a management of those parasites. So this is the activity that Life for Shibari uh, uh, Led in, in this pro lead in this project. And now we do data mobilization in uh, Parappa, in fractal tabs. Okay. Those are basically four steps. The, the first one, as usually, uh, we send out a preliminary, a preliminary survey. These are a simple set of questions with uh, profiled drop down menus as answers. Uh, this is to organize the, the answers that we obtain. And we need it because we want to know in advance the type and the volume of the data that we are going to receive and also to outline a strategy for the management of those data. In this case, uh, the response rate is quite satisfactory, it's 35%. Um, at this stage, uh, you don't need really to co-develop the, the, uh, uh, the survey with the partners, you can just drop the survey as it is. Then we have the um, research data management literacy. This is uh, to kick off the activity, and we did it in person in a meeting in Cyprus uh, last summer. Uh, this step is fundamental because you want to uh, uh, educate the partners of the project uh, around the, the basic concept of the data management. And it was also very useful because we were able to agree on the terminology of the project. Okay, at the beginning of the project, the partners uh, were used to talk about database interface platform uh, tools in a quite interchangeable way, but agree uh, on the terminology and us also to understand the real needs. Uh, it was important that it was an in presence event because it helps you to gain momentum for the next activities that were done all uh, online uh, and also to nominate a responsible person uh, to follow the activities. Then it comes to the core of the, of the process, uh, so the real data management. We uh, drafted a data management plan we did it using uh, Argos that is uh, developed by uh, OpenAir. Uh, the choice is because Argos gives you the possibility of producing also a, a machine readable um, data management plan and it allows to invite people to co-write the data management plan together with the, with the project partners. Uh, then at the end they realized that this is not really uh, I mean, useful to co-write together. You can just write the draft uh, and then send it uh, to review. In this moment, it's actually under review uh, by the partners. And it, it will be published soon, hopefully. Then we agreed on the uh, in templates 
to actually start getting the data. Okay. Uh, we agreed on three templates, one for the environmental variables, one for the occurrences, and one for the trades of the parent sites. Uh, we use the uh, technique of asynchronous uh, meetings, that means that I record the video, then the, the, the people um, that watch the video uh, can follow subsequently a series of webinars online uh, in we that were basically question and answer sessions, okay, where we try to solve practical issues in doing the organization of the data sets. The activity is still running, okay, it takes a lot of time. Um, and one thing that we learned is that you can ask the, the users, the data provider, to adjust, to organize the data, but don't ask them to map over uh, standards, such as Darwin Core, things like that. This is still an activity that we run in house. The last step is the actual data gathering. So uh, for now, we only receive four data sets out of the 44 we were expecting. And um, this is the 9%. Um, so I was not really satisfied with the percentage. And I was curious also to go back and see in another project that we are running uh, with LifeWatch Italy. What was the uh, ratio between data set received and the first scene at the beginning of the project? And the, the percentage is the same. So this is a bit disturbing, uh, but um, I think that we have definitely to work to improve this ratio. So one last slide on the lesson that, that I learned in this process. First of all, it is art and time consuming. Uh, especially with cost action, those are great projects when you want to organize meetings and training schools. But when it comes to work on the data, data sets, um, you really need dedicated personal and project dedicated that can uh, pay their times. Video recorded are uh, good. This is maybe something to take into consideration in future uh, training activities. And I'm going to send pretty soon a user feedback survey to, get, to gain feedback from the uh, data um, user community. Uh, this will help us to improve our models, that of course is imperfect now. Uh, but I also know that like Shidari is not the only node that have a data repository, so maybe it's not the only node that do data mobilization, so maybe we can exchange best practices and work to get a better model. And uh, the last one is for a question then, then uh, Alessandr, is if maybe we have to start thinking to new technologies to facilitate, to support this process of data mobilization. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. This is... Thank you, uh, Andrea. Fantastic. Uh, this is really very important. Uh, it's, it doesn't sound, you know, very rational to develop AI technologies and not being able to uh, implement them for the sake of the data mobilization. It doesn't make much sense to have a scientific uh, knowledge graph and not use it, actually, for the data mobilization. But on the top of that, and this is, you know, something that you have to spread out to your communities. Lightwood Eric has already opened a collection of paper, a collection of papers in biodiversity data journal. We pay for that. So tell your people if they want to publish the data. Uh, this is already a, a, a job that they can do, you know, for nothing, for free, and they can have, you know, a paper which is uh, on the top of that. Uh, it guarantees, you know, their uh, their um, ownership on the data. Thank you. Well, definitely, that's a big problem that the mobilization because we need data at the end. Thanks, uh, Andrea. Um, I'm Jose Manuel Avila from Live from the ICD Corp. Um, we are working with the agroecology community and. I will tell you later in the, in the session our experience with data mobilization. It was very brief because finally we got uh, nothing. Um, so I think it's, uh, 
more than a question, it's a comment. Uh, we need to work together with this best practice of change because it's difficult to create more sophisticated apps um, or services if we are not able to, to do this data mobilization from the uh, community of practice. We don't have this these numbers, but we expected these numbers, uh, this low percentage of data in the data mobilization. So let's work together in, in this um, this approach for collecting these best practices and experiences. And this is definitely you know, my call for all the people that do this hard um, job. Um, yeah, uh, the, the problem with, with data mobilization is that especially with old data, you know. You need the researcher that produces the data, and sometimes they just don't have time, uh, and they don't see any benefit in doing this, okay? So I think we have to spend a lot of time, a lot of effort to do training in that, okay? GPF is already doing, they're running a lot of data mobilization webinars, okay? For now, I'm, I'm participating for, you know, sake of see how they do it, how they manage it, um, and you see 20, 25 people participating, but I think that we are in, at the beginning of the step, and we have to work on that, uh, because it will remain in the future. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, next speaker on the program is Jaume Piera from the Institute de Sciences de Mar. Uh, the presentation is Towards the Network Collaboration on Marine Biology, DNA Risk Project. How that floor is yours. This, this project and there is and, and hopefully this will bring some I don't know if up to which one nice or new ideas that we discuss further. So basically and there is well just to clarify there is nothing to do with Game of Thrones. Some people ask me is it something related to that no it deals with this operational sensing life technologies for marine ecosystems. And I I I put exactly you know the, the call to frame it that idea, you know, it was a call, a European call, about the next generation of scientific instrumentation and tools and methods. And it was very much, you know, related and linked to the EDIS, the state of, to improve, you know, the European lead research infrastructures. So, basically, if you want, um, you can see that the, most of the budget goes to the, finally, to the EDIS, and you can see here, the involved EDIS and, and research infrastructures, and, and this because it was part of the goal, you know, we, we, we plan to create, you know, new technologies, life sensing, marine life sensing technologies to improve, you know, the capacity <coughs> of those areas. Um, and basically what we identify, and it has been, I think, already mentioned frequently, the information gaps. The needs to, to cover several information gaps in terms of temporal, spatial, or even taxonomical. And that's why we propose this idea, you know, to create this new very sensitive technologies, but very much, you know, focus. Uh, I like very much this, you know, review. And it was mentioned the challenges about the effective coordination with the ocean observing systems. And one of particular challenges to be addressed is this idea of transitioning from research to sustainable integrated observations. And this is basically the main goal in an And um, basically, we try to, to cover this, I would say, the concept of operational marine biology. So this idea, you know, to have systematic and long-term routine measurements of the ocean and coastal life. And to do so, basically, we identify this, I would say, genetic path pipeline, the acquisition, validation, degradation, and interpretation and disseminations. And as you will see, basically, in an area, we will try to do this part mostly, not exclusively, but we put a lot of effort on the services and technologies around acquisition and validation to make this operational marine biology possible. So, first, what kind of marine life we, we plan to sense? You can see that obviously it's quite challenging. If we think in terms of marine life, we have many orders of magnitude and size. So, we will not address only a single one. 
So we will try to combine omics or genomics, participatory, imaging, and biotics. And you can see that some of them, and particularly when we address particular instruments, they address and they focus on particular uh, science range. Hmm? So the idea is that combining all these type of scientific technologies to create what we call it operational marine biology products. Hmm? Um, this is the, the list of the proposed technologies. I will not go in detail of any of, of all of them because obviously we do not have time, but I will show you some snapshots of what we have in mind. Hmm? For example, um, in many cases we receive images that has not corrected and in terms of uh, color and, and image corrections. This could be done in an automatic way. And this will be one of the services. And we can identify, I don't know if you can see, that here there are like two organisms. So there is the fish and the parasite, the parasite. So um, this can be done automatically. And for example, once we have the images, we can send it to one of the platforms that we will use it in the system, in which we will try to identify and to return the identification of these um, organisms. Um, this can be done collaboratively, using, for example, citizen science approaches. I imagine that someone creates a picture uh, and he has this volunteer has no idea about what these kind of organisms. They can ask help from the rest of the community involved in that platform and they can provide some clues about which kind of species it is. And there are several different um, you know, algorithms you know, to end up with a, what is the general agreement between the community. We can improve this and we will do it during analysis, including artificial intelligence in between. Uh, this idea of hybrid or collaborative or intelligence. That will be one of the main aspects that we will address in an edit. Hmm? Um, so imagine, uh, we have the proposed technologies, we will end up with this operational marine biology data products and with this pipeline we will try to do several case studies in which we will try to validate this idea. And I will show you some of the, well, no, I, I will comment reply all the use cases and you will see the type of challenges we want to address. For example, in the case of uh, EMSO EDIC, I don't know if you are familiar with EMSO, but they have several nodes with that connected electro-optically to the coast. So there is no problem in, in terms of bandwidth of power. So you can put a lot of, I would say, hungry data and power systems. And we will put, we will put some imaging profiler systems or imaging flow cytometer systems. It may create easily, you know, terabytes up to petabytes of information per month. So the challenge is how, you know, to address this huge image, um, you know, volumes of data in order to make it operational. Because our first aim in that particular case is make operational products. So this will be one of the challenges and the use cases we will address. The second one is trying to complement what is a well, you know, well-established marine optics. The main problem, in, well, problem, or the main you know, issue in this network, which is very well established, is that there is a limited, obviously, number of stations now that are operational. So, for example, imagine here. So we have one station in the south of France, and the next one is in south of Portugal. So there is no information in the whole Mediterranean Peninsula. Right? So we need somehow you know, to fill these spatial gaps. And the challenge here is to try to cover Complementary, you know, with these new technologies that proposed in the to put some, you know, um, cover the spatial gaps with that more extended, that obviously will be for sure simplified. Not will be the same level of Mmobon because it's otherwise we will be just an extension of Mmobon. So the challenge is how we can address this, how one can we, what I would say, simplify all these technologies that allow you know to cover several of the spatial gaps that are now identified in the MOBOI. Um, there will be also the citizen science component, if you want the participatory one. So the idea, you know, is to engage people in collecting information, data. We have already started this, uh, what we call it, biomarathon. I don't know if you're familiar with BioBlitz. BioBlitz, you know, usually you record in very few days the many of the data. But in marine domain, you know, it's very tricky to do it in a job just three or four days. Because if there is bad weather, no way to take it. So let's do not a bioblitz, but a, rather a biomarathon. So we spend the whole summer offering you that kind of friendly competitions now in several locations in terms of who will be the one able to produce more data. 
And now we are doing, you know, very locally, for example, now in the Catalan coast, but now we're starting in Portugal, in several places uh, on, uh, on Italy. And you are more than welcome, whoever wants to participate, you are more than welcome to, to join us. And the idea is, is created with this, we, we hopefully create big data in terms of macroorganisms that can be used in the future, you know, to cover part of these spatial gaps so that one temporal gap will have been defined. And finally, the last, Use cases, the most experimental one is that thinking that we will collect, you know, macroorganisms in, with um, imaging and so on, and also omics, uh, we are able, and I put this as a kind of framework, this, this has been already done, uh, we will try to simplify this, but you know, in this particular case, um, people, what they did is they collected uh, macroinvertebrates, with this they created biotic index, but also at the same time they collect environmental DNA. And they, you know, link that, so it is to train the system, so in, in the future, if you just collect environmental DNA, could you create your uh, biotic index just based on this environmental data? This could be really, you know, interesting to try to do this in a simplified way to cover again all these temporal and spatial gaps we have in mind. So this will be the last uh, use case, will be the most experimental one. We will see, because it would depend mostly if we can uh, be you know, successful in these ideas of simplifying the protocols and the methods on the other cases. And basically this is the idea of an uh, We hope that this concept of rational marine biology will be consolidated and hopefully it will be very useful for LightWatch and the rest of the infrastructure. Many thanks. <laughs>
Uh, are you using uh, commercial uh, devices or there are prototypes also that you are using? Or for, for which one, sorry? The sensors. The sensor, the sensor, it depends. In some cases could be low cost, but in some cases not. For example, in the case of, of uh, I would say, high resolution plankton systems, it's uh, commercial devices. They are, uh, because we are improving, we, are, we have involved also, there are many SMEs involved in that, and in particular, there is one in that particular case from the Netherlands that they offer this imaging flow cytometer on the water. Okay. And, and they will improve that one to be connected to that uh, nodes. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Howard. So, our next speaker is uh, Justine Panier from the University of Gothenburg, Life of Cherik. Her presentation is Long Term Ecological Research on Marine Hard Bottom Communities using a network of genetic observatories and introduction to the new life of Cherik workflow for that analysis. Please, Justine, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so, hello everyone, uh, my name is Justine, uh, and I'm doing a research fellowship with LifeWatch, but I'm based in, in Sweden, in Gothenburg. Uh, so today I'm very excited to show you the project in which I've been involved those last few months, uh, and some of its recent findings. And I will also present the new workflow that LifeWatch has been developing for data analysis. So, as you probably all know, uh, monitoring uh, marine biodiversity is essential because we want to be able to understand the dynamics behind uh, biodiversity decline and its effect on ecosystems. Uh, so, we want to be able to track changes in diversity, uh, distribution, uh, abundances of species over time and space, um, and gain insight, insight into the drivers of those changes. But there are uh, two challenges when we want to monitor marine biodiversity. The first one is to do it over larger spatial and temporal scales. And the second one is to do it in complex habitats like uh, rocky seafloors that are hard to sample. So one uh, solution that has been developed uh, is called Autonomous Reef Monitoring Structures, or ARMS. And they basically look like this, so a stack of nine plates uh, that are designed to mimic the complexity of uh, coral reef structures. So different kind of organisms can settle there, uh, IG, small invertebrates, um, and they are put in the bottom of the sea for a period ranging from a few months to a year. And after that time, they are retrieved and brought back to the surface. And each of those nine plates uh, is then dismantled, and we take a picture of each of them on both sides, uh, we also identify visually some organisms uh, that are uh, bigger. And then everything <coughs> that grew on top of those plates is scraped, uh, and we perform DNA metabarcoding on the samples obtained. And DNA metabarcoding is a nice te technique to obtain uh, taxonomic identification with a fine resolution. So all in all, arms enable a standardized and non-destructive uh, sampling of benthic communities. So a few words about the arms uh, network which is part of the Amazon network. Uh, it has been established to perform a long-term uh, and large-scale uh, monitoring of the hard bottom communities. And to this date, it counts 23 observatories all uh, along the European uh, coastline, and also in some polar region and in the Red Sea. So uh, there is a sampling campaign going on since 2018, but the data obtained from 2022 are still being processed and analyzed, so I will, for my presentation today, focus on the data obtained until 2021. And this means 125 uh, arms units in 23 observatories in 14 countries and during three years. So, through the development of this uh, project, the goal is to generate data that follow the FAIR principles, so we want them to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So first I have to say that ARMS data are open access and quality control. And in the ARMS data set, you can find references to physical samples, uh, metadata descriptions that are as precise as possible, uh, images of the plates and sometimes of the local environment, sequences data, derived species observation, and uh, the documentation of the analytical process. So now let's go to some uh, results. On those graphs, you can see the distribution of identified species across taxa. 
so on the first one, you can see that most of them uh, came from the, the kingdom Metazoa, which are multicellular organisms. Uh, this is also because today for my presentation, I focus on the CO1 marker, which is uh, one of the main markers used in DNA metabarcoding. And when we go a bit more into detail, we see that the main phyla could be also sampled, so from Arthropoda, Neida, Mollusca, etc. So, but the, the main point here is to show that ARMS unit could um, sample a high diversity, which is exactly what we are looking for. On this second graph, you can see the number of uh, identified species in three ecological groups across observatories. So, this shows the potential uh, application for ARMS uh, units because they were sensitive to different kind of key species, for example, uh, vulnerable and threatened species, uh, sensitive species, but also something that is very interesting to us in LifeWatch, uh, the alien species that you can see in light blue in this graph. Another graph that shows uh, this kind of diversity across a gradient of four habitat categories with different human footprints. So this first one, this box plot, shows the species richness uh, in industrial, semi-industrial, low human impact, and marine protected areas. Uh, and it has been proved with the one way ANOVA test that the species richness, richness was higher in marine protected area, which is um, a, a common result that is found in many studies. However, when we wanted to uh, test uh, um, genetic diversity, so ASVs here, which are uh, unique DNA sequences, we didn't find any differences uh, between the areas. This has been also tested with the CRISPR and Wallis test. Uh, and we don't know exactly why. Uh, we will investigate this in the future. There are possibilities and uh, things to try. So uh, now that we've seen a few cool results that ARMS data can give us, uh, let's just take a step back and ask how to process all of this genetic data efficiently. Uh, because this ARMS project is generating an enormous amount of data. And that's where LifeWatch uh, enters the game. Because in the frame of the internal joint initiative, um, ARMS was picked up as one of the five validation cases. Uh, so a new workflow is being developed and we've heard a bit about it those last days, but I will present it a bit deeper and from a user perspective, from a biologist perspective. So this you've seen already is uh, the, the entrance to the, the, pipe, the, the workflow. So you first log in and then here is the page that you access. Uh, first with your personal space, with the, the document that you uploaded on the platform and on the left side are the five workflows of the five validation cases and of course, today we focus on the ARMS of the presentation. Uh, so the ARMS workflow has two uh, parts. The first one is metabarcoding analysis, and the second one is conventional community analysis. Uh, but today I will focus on the first one, which is the main one, and the second one is still at early stages of development. So here is how it looks like. Uh, a bit confusing, but don't worry, I will make it more digestible for you. Basically, it's Ten steps that allow to go from raw DNA sequences to a table uh, containing the taxonomic identification of the species. Here is uh, how the workflow looks like on the Tesseract platform. So we start with this first part on the left, uh, that are the five first steps, uh, and it's basically giving an in the input files that the workflow needs to uh, to treat the data. So, for example, we choose the sequences we want to analyze and they are retrieved from the ENA dat database. Uh, we also give uh, parameter files to tell the workflow how we want the pipeline to treat our uh, genetic data. Then comes the, the second part, which is the main part, it's PEMA. PEMA stands for Pipeline for Environmental DNA Metabarcoding Analysis. So here the point is to uh, identify the sequences that have been treated and uh, uh, five marker genes, the main ones that are used in the, in the field, are supported by PEMA. Step six is just building a, a table with the, so the reference to the, the, the sequences and then the identification, the taxonomic identification. And then we go to worms to check if there is a, a match to the identified, uh, to the obtained taxa. And if there is a match on worms, then it gets the scientific name and the AFIA ID. 
And with the output of the previous steps, then we go to RIMS, which is the World Register of Invasive Marine Species. Uh, and we check the known distribution of the, the observed species, and then the, the workflow can tell us if it's uh, native or introduced or yeah, alien in the area where um, some, uh, um, unit sampled it. Then there is step nine, which is uh, the MAC converter, just converted the PEMA outputs uh, into different formats for different kind of uses, uh, human readable and machine readable. And finally, there is step 10, uh, which is mainly based on RV lab uh, uh, from Life Watch as well. Uh, and it's basically uh, performing different kind of uh, ecological analysis. Here it's mainly multidimensional scaling, which is very good if you want to compare uh, different samples in different uh, uh, areas. So after running your workflow, you can go to the dashboard and then you will have a list of all the workflows you've been running with their status, their date, uh, and clicking on that little uh, icon here. You can get the outputs of each of the steps of the workflow. And I will show you a few of them that are, uh, that are useful. For example, you get a notio table. So we, here on the left, the reference of the sequences. Uh, the number of reads in each sample, and then the taxonomic identification. And this goes uh, together with the FASTA file of all the sequences for the workflow, where there is the same reference and then the actual uh, DNA sequence. Then you also get a zip file with all the outputs of PEMA, which is very good if you want to go into details and see what the pipeline actually did to your sequences. And you get also a log file for each of the workflow steps in case the workflow fails for whatever reason, you want to be able to go there and check what happened. So there are many ways to analyze ARMS data, but why is it nice to use this workflow? Um, the first reason is, is that you can run PEMA on LifeWatch resources, so you don't need to install anything on your computer and it's saving a lot of time and energy. Um, you can run PEMA over and over and test different permutation of the parameters and see what works best for your dataset. And you can keep the results into your dashboard so it's easy to go back and have a look at them if needed. So now a few words, what's next? Uh, so this workflow will keep still being developed by LifeWatch and uh, we will start using it to run PEMA on big amount of ARMS data because it keeps uh, giving new data, generating new data that now have to be processed. Um, and, and here are a few organizations and people that I would like to thank. So LifeWatch and the members of the International Joint Initiative are the people working behind the workflows. Uh, ARMS Network and all of its members that are constantly deploying new ARMS units in the sea. EMPRC and Assemble Plus and also I uh, would like to thank Matthias Hobst, uh, Katina Exter, and Christina Pavudi, which are the people I've been working with since I started my fellowship, and that helped me a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Uh, floor is open for questions and comments. Sorry, maybe you explain it, but uh, I missed that part. When you take out the arms, and you just, then you ensemble again and put it, or you you take out all, all the organisms that were uh, settled in, in the system? Yeah, we take everything, so first pictures, and then take everything to make the samples. Actually, I don't know if then it can be all really washed and reused again, the actual plates, but yeah, it's not put back directly in the sea. Because just for curiosity, it would be interesting to have time series of how it colonized the, the system, or no? Yes, so this is also something that has been studied a bit to see if the, the number of, in the time we put them in the sea influences the colonization and, and the diversity that then we can find. Um, and I think, yeah, it shows that it's a minimum of three months that is a good time to put them to, to have a, a nice overview of the diversity there. Uh, but then depending of, on, on what you want to study, you might want to keep them a bit longer. Just to add, the units can be reused. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, because I was wondering, you know, if the, you know, the, the rate of colonization can give you some clues about the status of the quality or, or the health of that ecosystem. Yes, yes. So it's also used for this, like, long-term studies and 
and see how the, the actual ecosystem evolves with time. So it's, it's nice to compare different, from different places, but also from different points in time in the same places. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Justine. Uh, we have a little change in the program. Unfortunately, our next speaker, Javier Martinez Lopez from the Andalusian Inter University Institute for Health System Research, uh, is unable to speak today. It's a phonic. So, his colleague, Domingo Carras, recorded a video which will be screened right now. So, over to the video. See you. Thanks. And sorry, the presentation is Remote Nevadensis, a tool for monitoring changes in essential biodiversity variable in mountain ecosystems by means of remote sensing. Just a little note, uh, we we'll open the floor for questions because they won't be able to reply. Next presentation is again from Javier, so it's going to be again a video. Uh, but uh, this is the chance to remind you all that you received yesterday in your mailbox the abstract book where you can find the email address. So if you have questions, you can write to the present to the authors. And uh, together with the abstract book, we received a form where we invite you to give your feedback about this conference, and it is very important for us. So please fill that in. Yes, I will. Uh, we ask authors to give their permissions, so we will publish on the website next week because connections is a little bit tricky these days. Uh, presentations in the mini site of the conference, of course, only those for which we receive the authorization, so you will find them. Uh, yeah, exactly. In the meanwhile, the video charges. Maybe I go ahead to another speaker. If uh, Delia Velasco Montero is here, thank you. Sorry for anticipating your presentation. Uh, Delia is from the Instituto de Microelectronica de Sevilla. Uh, she's going to um, talk to us about auto automatic dot counting and reporting based on artificial vision and uh, an IoT data management platform. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Delia, and I'm going to talk about uh, automatic back counting and remote reporting through an IoT data management platform. Uh, I, I work, uh, uh, I am a postdoctoral researcher from the Instituto de Microelectronica de Sevilla. This is a, a research and development joint center of the National, Council, uh, National Research Council and the University of Seville. And uh, in contrast of uh, some of you, I am now a bi biologist, but I am a specialized in technology. Um, and uh, we as a research group, we work, uh, uh, we have a, a background in microelectronic design, uh, software uh, development and algorithmic solutions. And uh, for this talk, uh, we must emphasize our uh, experience in three topics. Uh, firstly, the development of uh, smart, uh, so, uh, smart hardware sensors capable of processing information in situ. Uh, also uh, about uh, software development and integration on embedded devices, and also on um, uh, software uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence to process uh, the collective data. So all in all, we have the knowledge to pro provide technological solutions and tools to monitor uh, wildlife populations with minimum impacts to the environment. 
Uh, the, the focus of this talk uh, is uh, emerges from the bad monitoring uh, research ta task within Sanhal project. Uh, there is an increasing need of uh, monitoring the population of large nocturne, which is a, a vulnerable species of uh, a considered vulnerable species. And several technologies are uh, available to uh, monitor these uh, individuals. Uh, for example, uh, chip markings or uh, GPS or video recording. Uh, I am focusing here in video recording in conjunction with computer vision algorithms to provide um, uh, uh, useful information. Uh, in addition, this inf information can be as uh, accessible through an uh, online software platform which uh, uh, is uh, ready to use uh, for biologists. Uh, concerning our setup, uh, we, have, we make use of commercial uh, CCTV cameras currently installed in the Doñana National Park. Um, uh, we develop a software, a customized software solution to provide the um, uh, uh, data, uh, provide data with high added value for the biologists. And finally, we can provide the data through a software platform. And this is the software, hardware, and algorithm that we provide. Uh, this is an example of a video frame captured by one of those cameras in Doñana. Uh, and a biologist may primarily, primarily focus their attention on, the, on these uh, regions of interest marked here in, in blue. Uh, uh, and if they, they can uh, count the entries and exits of the bats in these boxes, they can get an idea of the bat activity and perform the research. So this uh, bat counting and activity monitoring is a uh, main task of uh, the research, but if this is a time-consuming task, so we pro propose uh, an automatic bat counting approach uh, is also performed on these regions of interest, but uh, is automatically processed uh, by, uh, by uh, an algorithm. Um, these, uh, these cameras uh, record video sequences uh, during all, all the nights, but this is, uh, these are very, these are very uh, uh, quite long sequences that require a manual review that this is really time consuming and expensive process. So we propose this algorithm to facilitate the work and minimize uh, human labor. Uh, this is an, is an example of a, a summary of how the algorithms uh, work, but just at, at user level. Uh, firstly, the, the user can select the region of interest uh, on which the algorithm will be performed. Uh, this, this region includes, uh, in general, the, the entries of the boxes. And uh, uh, this selection can be done online on an uh, easy-to-use software platform that I mentioned before. And then the, the computer vision algorithm will perform the, the, the bad detection on all of the uh, videos and record during the night. So when the algorithm detects an individual, as shown here, it's, uh, it registers the time stamp corresponding to these uh, to these bats, and uh, finally, it's possible to uh, provide a comprehensive report about all the entries and exits of the bats, uh, and we can provide also uh, geographical information about the boxes and uh, all the information concerning the location of the box and the time of the of the bat detection, so that the the user can only uh, watch uh, this uh, report uh, instead of uh, reviewing all the video sequences that this is really uh, consuming. Here you have an example of, uh, of uh, functionality. On the left you have uh, the region of interest uh, previously uh, selected uh, before starting the algorithm. And on the right, you have a frame corresponding to just the uh, time stamp generated by the software uh, because of a uh, bad uh, detection event. You can, you can uh, check that uh, there is uh, indeed a bad in this, in this detected uh, event. 
this this should be a video in which you can see the the real uh, footage and uh, record by one of the cameras and uh, it, when the bat uh, was entering uh, it, a detection that was uh, shown in this screen but this is not a video <laughs> actually <laughs> and finally we also provide um, another uh, asset that is an um, online, online software platform that provides all the information that we, uh, we have extracted uh, with, in a simple way. This uh, software platform provides uh, periodic reports about, uh, in this case, about bad activity and it can also send data to mobile phones. Uh, in addition, it can collect uh, data coming from different sensors in the, in the field such as RFID technology, for, for instance, and uh, aggregate all the data uh, for uh, uh, easy to use uh, for biologists. And finally, I, uh, uh, last but not least, I, am, I must emphasize that we are working in the, in the line of knowledge transfer. Uh, we are currently recognized as a company based on, on knowledge by the University of Seville under the, under the name of Biodiverse. And we, we work to provide a smart solution to monitor population with minimum impacts to the environment. So, uh, the takeaways of this talk is that the uh, most uh, current technology uh, to monitor population is passive in general, which, which means that it only collects data and we pro propose to uh, apply a smart solution that provides analyzed data. Uh, it was demonstrated with a, a use case in, the, in this talk uh, focused on bad counting. But the most important conclusion of this talk is that we work uh, in the intersection of software, hardware, and artificial intelligence to provide um, a useful information with reduced manual labor. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Delia. Uh, please, uh, floor is open for questions. Bless uh, Haube and Bernard. Thank you, Delia. I, I was willing because um, in that particular case, you need to do the back detection um, considering the boxes. Um, and I was willing, in terms of uh, uh, you know, scalability and application in other cases, uh, have you ever seen in using passive acoustics, I mean, because now that there is available low-cost technologies that you, you, you know you can track and record even high-frequency uh, uh, bad voice, bad, bad, bad sounds. And yes. it seems for me, I mean, maybe it's, I'm wrong that with with these sound trap systems, uh, first you don't need to identify the region of interest. Secondly, I guess that you need also the infrared lights, you know, to, to illuminate the box or not in the uh, The box are illuminated during the night and concerning the passive monitoring and uh, acoustic monitoring, we are also working on that uh, on that line. We are working on uh, automatically analyze the audios uh, recorded in the, in the field. But uh, and this aggregation with the data with the video will be really useful. But in this talk, uh, I don't have time to do everything. <laughs> Do you think it's it, it important to have both, or you could replace it? I think that the uh, relation of all the data uh, gives us a more reliable information. Okay. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> um, I was wondering, uh, so what we see is a camera that continuously watches a bat box and identifies the region of interest, but there is also see there's quite a large of an area around the whole bat box itself. I would assume that you could also zoom in on that, on that specific spot to reduce the amount of data that you generate. And this is where my question is about. This processing of the images, where does this actually happen and how is data transmitted? So is the image being processed locally on the camera or close to the camera and the results are being transmitted? Or are the, is the data recorded and then analyzed elsewhere? The, the camera are uh, recording all the night according to a prescribed uh, schedule and the videos are uh, stored in a server and the algorithm is uh, performed uh, the, during the night after all the nights uh, and all the videos are recorded. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, 
Uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, only the, the record of the camera uh, start when something happens in the region of interest, or do you make a banding box after something happens, not only in the region of interest? Uh, if I understand the question, we have the camera recording all the time, and we select a region, and when the software detects some movement in this region, it, when the, there is a gap. So, uh, so you have the banding box previously? Uh, the user can select the box, uh, and okay. we only uh, process the data in this box. Okay, okay, thank you. Hello. So um, I am Rumai Fahadli. I am assistant in uh, life for Chemic and uh, researcher in the Dusky Institute. So I am interested and I would like to know what is the type of uh, deep learning model that is used to perform the task of uh, that detection. In this case, in particular, we are not using a deep learning model. It's just a, a motion detection model, but we are working also in the line of using deep learning models. But in this case, it was more because we have a lot of data and deep learning models are really uh, computational and expensive. It was this easy solution is better because simple solutions are always better. <laughs> Hi, Dalia. Thank you for, for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, is there any reason why you are recording the video instead of uh, using a passive infrared sensor to detect when you have movement? Uh, we are not using. We are also uh, some of these uh, individuals are marked with uh, RFID technology, so we can cross check uh, the data coming from from this uh, technology and from these video sequences. But it is the only uh, technology that we are currently using. Last question from the back. Just a comment about this last question, Simone. Uh, the point with passive uh, infrared detection is that it's very slow. So when you are detecting one uh, individual, maybe there are three of them leaving the, the box or the other way around. So uh, definitely you need this camera system to, to keep tracking uh, of all the, the, the individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so we are able now to show you the video. Uh, again, the presentation is Ramon de Nebadensi, a tool for monitoring changes in essential biodiversity variables in mountain ecosystems by means of remote sensing. And the wing of Keras is going to accompany for this video. Okay, let's get back to our live speakers. Um, our next presenter is, uh, if he is in the room, uh, Victor Galvin Coronil uh, from the Instituto de Microelectronica de Sevilla. Uh, his presentation is Low Power, Low Cost, Reconfigurable IoT Device for Remote One Life Monitoring. Welcome, Victor. Glory is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm for the same thing as Delia Velasco that have just presented. Okay, uh, 
this work is part of Project Sumhal, Working Package 4. Uh, uh, here we are working with two species that are kestrels and bats. And we are working here together, engineers and biologists, to, to make solutions to get valuable data uh, so they can study these, these species. Uh, for that, biologists need parameters like like that, uh, RFID, that are uh, tags located at individuals to, to detect them, uh, video, audio, weight, uh, ambient parameters like temperature, humidity, and we are working at different locations, mainly in Guyana National Park, but also in La Pampa del Condado, Villalba del Alcón, and also in the province of Elba, near there. Uh, so to reach uh, real-time real -time data acquisition, uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, we need a, a system with, we are, we are having issues. <laughs> okay. We need a system like, like that, as you are seeing now. Uh, we need this element, first of all, to get uh, physical parameters through, through sensors. We need a device that we call uh, data logger. And this data logger uh, sends the information through a network infrastructure that in our case is valuable because we are working at different locations with different characteristics. And this data is received at a data management uh, platform where it's processed and stored in databases to finally be shown in visualization panels. So, uh, in this talk, uh, it's focusing in the data over development, and I'm going to give uh, an overview of the whole system. Uh, this data over needs uh, to have these characteristics. And uh, it needs to deal with multiple sensors, multiple communications, low power locals, uh, for the reason to, to be deployed at uh, the field. And it needs to be versatile because we want to use it with different species, uh, different parameters, different locations. So, uh, this is the solution that we designed. This is a modular device for remote monitoring with this specification that I'm going to explain now. Uh, the, first of all, this uh, modular connectivity. Uh, we use a standard communication connector where we can find uh, at market more than 140 communication transceivers. This means that depending on the location, we can be working with cable, Wi-Fi, internet connection, or in more remote uh, areas, we can be working with mobile network, or even with satellite network in, in areas where, is, where there's no uh, any uh, network coverage. And following the same strategy, uh, we have five uh, standard sensor connectors. Uh, where we can find at market more than 160 uh, sensors, sensor models of, uh, of different, to collect different parameters like temperature, can use microphones, cameras, motion detectors, sensors, and uh, much more. Uh, another important feature of, uh, of this device is that uh, where it can be used as a, as a conventional data logger, but uh, the important point is that uh, we can make it uh, smarter. In the sense, for example, that it can, it can make a smart power management going through different operation modes to make it more efficient. Uh, we can perform data filtering <coughs> Uh, uh, identifying events of interest and even using time matching learning techniques to identify patterns and uh, take only valuable uh, data, discounting irrelevant data. And this is a key feature because nowadays we can find that market uh, conventional uh, conservation technology solution like smart cameras 
But the problem with with that technology is that it generates such a big amount of of data that the biologists can uh, are not able to process of the data and need a lot of hours uh, of repetitive work to filter that. And even if uh, this processing is not yeah. enough, uh, we have an interface with more powerful uh, uh, platforms that can perform uh, artificial intelligence algorithms like Raspberry Pi. And combining both devices, uh, we can reach a solution like, uh, for example, a smart camera trap that we are working on that can give you uh, images where it detects an animal and discard the rest. And this device connects to an um, Internet of Things platform that we have developed also at the project that we can make custom panels depending on the biologist uh, needs uh, with graphic elements like map, maps, graphs, uh, video streaming or whatever they want to, to improve their workflow. Uh, this platform can, can be also used to configure the devices and even to update them with new software using a technique known as over-the-air programming. Okay. And now I'm going to show uh, the, the application where, where we are using this device. Uh, the first one is this bad monitoring system. Uh, here you see this box that used by but it's a small box that has an antenna in the entrance, so we can detect uh, each individual with RFID that is entering or exiting in the box, and all this information is sent to, to the platform to be combined with uh, other software uh, algorithms that, like the one that Delia Blasco just presented. We can configure uh, alarms to be shown at the uh, biology's mobile phones, so they have total control of individuals. This is another solution we are developing. It is a smart mess uh, for orchestras. This uh, also uses RFID technology to detect individuals. Uh, also can rate the birds uh, we are also using their cameras to take images and videos of, of customers. Um, they also can use it to capture them. These have a door that can be remotely activated uh, by a, a tiny motor. Uh, so they, they can monitor uh, a lot of parameters of, uh, yes, from the office. And now I have, I have some videos showing the, how is the solution in the platform, how the biologists see this data. And here, it, this is for bad solution. We have a map, a map where they see all the boxes and the, the resting activity. They can select each box and they, they, they see uh, live streaming of the box, uh, of the data we Detected. And here they can configure uh, the software that Daniel Velasco has explained. They can select in this interface, they can adjust the, the region of interest. And there is where they see camera elements for the detection that has been detected. And this is the solution for gestures. They here see a general view of, of four boxes. And there they see readings of individuals, also video streaming. And now we are going to, to incorporate in this panel all uh, the, the rest of the, of the information, like weight, uh, ambiental parameters, and all that I have uh, explained. So I think we can return to the presentation, please.
Okay, thank you. Designed to be open hardware or, or it will be proprietary hardware? This is the first question. And the second one, it was not clear, maybe you mentioned and I miss it, but you have live uh, streaming. Um, so then, why do you need IoT? Because if, if you have the connection, I mean, large bandwidth, um, do you need uh, IoT or, or it's just because sometimes you are considering using? You know, lower bandwidth and whatever, and, 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 all, and other times whenever it's available, I don't know which kind of, of method you use to have this uh, live streaming. Okay. Uh, for the first question, it is not open hardware for the reason that uh, we are trying to transfer this, this to a company. We have to license it at the uh, industrial circuit and this kind of things, so that is not possible. And um, the second question, uh, we are using this live streaming because uh, we are combining new technology that we are developing, like these smart boxes that we have, not a streaming, just a camera that we can control. But uh, we are uh, uh, combining that with conventional technologies that Biologist uh, was uh, already using. Uh, so, what we do is to take this conventional technology and integrate it in the platform and with, with software development, uh, like the ones that Delia showed, to also take advantage that of, of this technology that already have uh, biologists. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised, so thank you, Victor. Thank you. We'll give it another try with the video. Let's see if it now we also get the sounds. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tommy. Indo Alcaraz. I am uh, from the University of Granada. I must apologize because uh, Javier Martinez Lopez was supposed to give this talk, but he got very sick uh, yesterday. And uh, I will have a men medical appointment for today, so I cannot attend either. Um, so, sorry from both of us. Uh, the presentation uh, relates to remote nevadensis, uh, which is a system for monitoring changes in essential biodiversity variables that we are developing in the Smart Eco Mountains uh, Lightwatch uh, project. Uh, this uh, initiative started a long time ago in the University of Buenos Aires by the group of Jose Barruelo, then continued in the University of Almeria by the group of Javier Cabello and Cecilio Llenate and the University of um, uh, Virginia by the group of Harry Epstein and Amanda Armstrong and then many people that have worked uh, recently in, from the University of uh, Granada including uh, it is all the company, external company that is uh, helping us to develop and also like watch Eric uh, to develop this, uh, this uh, 
platform. Uh, the idea is to uh, build a monitoring system for protected areas, also for uh, it, it can be extended to non protected areas uh, that uh, inform, uh, that provides real time information that is comparable between different locations, different protected areas, that is relevant for managers and understandable for, for by citizens, and that uses the uh, framework of essential biodiversity uh, variables. The idea is to use multi temporal um, scale uh, the, the satellite archive, uh, identifying spatial and temporal patterns in ecosystem functions and also in ecosystem structure, uh, to use the, all the multiple spatial and temporal resolutions that are available under standardized protocols for different environments, and uh, taking the advantage of having a low cost or even a, a cheap. Uh, sorry, a free uh, cost uh, and not comparable to the field campaigns. And also, we are uh, using the uh, language Eric uh, uh, idea of users as scale, like uh, providing information that is science based, that is relevant for managers, and that is informative to society. Uh, the framework of essential diversity variables, uh, just if you don't know it, Basically, it's an initiative by GeoBon, which is uh, coordinated by the Commission of uh, Biolo Biological Diversity, and it aims to provide a, minus, a minimum set of essential measures that capture the main dimension of, of biodiversity regarding composition, structure, and, and function, uh, to inform on the status of biodiversity that are sensitive to changes in, in the biodiversity and that are effective uh, and ecosystem agnostic, independent, and that can be applicable at a global scale. In our case, the ecosystem dimensions are basically uh, functional dimensions. We are also including some structural ones, but basically are functional dimensions related to uh, nutrient cycles. For instance, uh, our soil the soil concentration, organic carbon, such as vegetation indexes, chlorophyll concentration in water bodies, uh, the metabolic energy available for herbivores, the, in, in regarding uh, energy balance, we are providing surface temperature, albedo, and transpiration. Regarding water balance, we are providing a of transpiration as well, latent heat, snow cover dynamics, and water content in vegetation and soil. So, uh, remote uh, meta analysis, the aim is to alert us on changes in these essential biodiversity variables, uh, mainly, as I said, related to ecosystem functions. Uh, such as primary productions or moisture, snow cover, among others. The three different types of users uh, in, within this virtual research environment are researchers and managers that have programming skills because we are using the Google Earth Engine programming environment, so they can access it with Python or JavaScript. Then, the uh, second type is non programmer users basically manager, managers and researchers that do not have programming skills but need satellite information to take decisions. And finally, uh, any citizen that uh, will access pre-calculated uh, set of uh, variables with the storytelling informing on the changes uh, or reference conditions that we are, or anomalies that we are uh, observing. This is the uh, general idea. So for the different ecosystem dimensions, we select different variables like greenness, uh, snow indexes, land surface temperature, etc. from different sensors. Up to now, we have MODIS, Landsat, and Sentinel-2. We uh, are fusing different sensors to do uh, quality filtering, to remove clouds, uh, aerosols, and also to do a gap filling um, across uh, several of these uh, sensors. Once we have these pre-processing steps uh, achieved, we enter into the analysis. We have five main types of analysis. The reference conditions, uh, which is the long-term uh, reference dynamics that uh, these variables have experienced in the past. Uh, we calculate a set of meaningful uh, variables, we call them functional attributes, uh, that inform on, on key biological meaningful aspects of the dynamics of these uh, essential variables. Then we detect uh, short-term anomalies like extreme events, droughts, uh, fires, um, heat waves, etc. 
We also have a model for long-term trends to see whether there are deterministic uh, uh, increases or decreases in the time series of these uh, uh, variables. And then we provide a special uh, variability analysis uh, based on ecosystem functional types and habitat functional types uh, to calculate the richness and rarity in ecosystem functions, whether there's a hotspot of multifunctionality or if there is a very unique combinations of different functions in, a, in an area. With all this information, we are encapsulating it into three interfaces, a uh, programming interface uh, for um, researchers and managers, and not programming interface where you can click and select different combinations, and then um, just a visualization uh, uh, interface for, for citizens where they can um, select just a small number of uh, predefined combinations. This is the aspect of the um, researcher or, or um, manager that has programming skills. You can see here that you have different... Um, sorry, I think I got the message. Uh, yes, I want to stay in the call on oh, Mars. Sorry. Um, so, um, as I was saying, um, we can select different combinations of the variable, the sensors that we want to use, the dates, uh, the, the analysis where we want to calculate trends, anomalies, whatever, and apply, and we will get a loading a link to the load uh, of the information. Uh, so this is the how the uh, coding interface looks like. Uh, these are libraries in Google Earth Engine that we can uh, that you can call from from even from the Google Earth Engine interface, or you can use our own interface. Um, this is an example of a report in, uh, of a graph uh, that can be pre uh, this uh, calculated. Sorry, uh, you can select here different combinations and and have in this case the EDI of 2020 and 2021 for for the overall Sierra Nevada. Um, this is uh, another, uh, uh, well, as, uh, another example. As you can see here, there is no code available for programmers, so it's only what can be selected here, the operations that are selected here. For instance, if we have implemented the Mankendall trend test and the researcher wants uh, a linear trend test, it, it cannot be used here. Uh, he or she should ask as to do it or uh, use the code uh, interface. Um, in, and for the citizen, uh, for instance, the, they have a limited number of selections available, uh, and, and uh, including a short explanation, for instance, for uh, the launch of France, they cannot choose any period of time to calculate the launch of France. It's, it's going to be from the first day of the record to the last day of the of the record uh, with an explanation of what's going on. Uh, these are some examples, for instance, for the citizen interface. Here is the uh, long-term NDVI trend for the uh, based on the Lancet archive for Sierra Nevada, the whole Sierra Nevada. These are for different uh, seasons, uh, spring, autumn, summer, and winter. Uh, also for the whole Sierra Nevada based on uh, Lancet. Uh, in the case of the programmer interface, it, the, we can upload a KML, in this case a KML with the different ecosystems of Sierra Nevada. So uh, the, the interface uh, provides you with a graph of the reference dynamics for NDVI for the different ecosystem, ecosystems from 1985 to 2023 based on, on the Lancet archive. Uh, another example with the ecosystem functional types um, summarizing the special heterogeneity variability uh, of uh, productivity, seasonality, and uh, phenology of Sierra Nevada. Uh, we are also including a uh, richness of ecosystem functional types um, uh, layer that can also be accessed uh, by the citizens, um, also researchers and, and programmers. Uh, this is the long-term trends in the snow cover, uh, also from Landsat. From this, we have uh, assessed, for instance, the difference, 
looking at this right block, you, the researcher can upload a KML file uh, with three different types of treatments after fire, post-fire treatments, like it's no intervention, uh, partial clearing of the burnt trees and salvage logging of the of every uh, burnt tree is removed. And we are showing the uh, duration of snow cover after um, uh, fire, and we see that no intervention, uh, logs with no intervention tended to to have more duration of snow than the places where all the wood was uh, removed uh, after fire. So managed and take the decisions, and this didn't imply them any uh, programming. Another example is uh, we are calibrating with in situ observations of chlorophyll A concentration in, in lakes. We are providing a set of uh, spectral indexes that correlate well with uh, chlorophyll concentration to monitor chlorophyll content in, in these lakes. Another example is uh, aerosol intrusions. We are using MERA to uh, monitor from the 80s the uh, concentration of dust and aerosols in the atmospheres and, and intrusions, uh, which is one of the nutrient cycling uh, inputs uh, to, to these, uh, the main inputs uh, to these lakes. Uh, another example is the, the diversity of functional habitat types, where we are using climatic structural and functional values to classify uh, ecosystems, so identify the system in a homogeneous way. Uh, in all, all protected areas of the world. This is uh, the approach uh, followed by the Digital Observatory of Protected Areas uh, by the Joint Research Center. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it allows to compare uh, any protected area of the world. We're also implementing this in remote analysis. And in conclusion, basically, uh, we are offering um, a monitoring system for key biodiversity variables related to ecosystem structure, functioning, and also services, as we, you will see in the next presentation. For instance, carbon cycling, water uh, uh, content, and nutrient inputs, uh, etc. Uh, for these variables, we offer reference conditions, long-term trends, rapid changes, and short-term anomalies like extreme events. Uh, in a fast, reliable uh, way for all areas, for any area, indeed. And we are following the reliable tree reserve environment framework with three types of users. Uh, uh, we are uh, offering um, interface for programmers, an interface for researchers or managers with no programming skills, and also an interface for the general citizenship. Uh, basically, our aim is to, to break to overcome the barrier of non programmers uh, to access satellite information. And we hope that this monitoring system uh, proves to be useful and necessary as any of as other monitoring systems like Global Forest Watch or Global Service Watch bodies to, to take more informed uh, decisions on, uh, on biodiversity for, uh, for biodiversity conservation. So uh, that's all. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can address them to Ana Mellado or Ana de Galagla or uh, Rojai Pajali that are over there. My name again is Domingo Alcaraz uh, from the University of Granada and uh, my colleague Javier uh, Martinez uh, Lopez can also uh, assist you in resolving any questions that you could uh, have. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Our next presentation is again video recording with Domingo's voice featuring um, Javier Martinez Lopez's presentation. In this case, the title is Essential Ecosystem Service Variables and Models in Mountain Areas, a case study in Sierra Nevada, Spain. Uh, we're going to launch the video now. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Here I am again, Domingo Alcaraz Segura from the University of Granada, because my colleague uh, Javier Martinez Lopez got sick and could not attend. Um, this talk is about what we are doing uh, on modeling ecosy essential ecosystem service uh, variables in, uh, in 
mountain areas, uh, particularly in, in Sierra Nevada. Um, basically, uh, as you know, ecosystem services are increasingly important for society under ongoing global and climate change scenarios, and we aim to study uh, and conserve the biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, but using uh, tools to monitor their supply and, and demand, not only the ecosystem services supply, but also the ecosystem services uh, demand. Um, we are developing several uh, models uh, from the side of the, from the demand side uh, related to water, to grazing, to above ground carbon storage, uh, to seed dispersal, also regarding uh, cultural services, and uh, also regarding decisions uh, on uh, whether or not uh, changing the land use or uh, land uh, uh, the models have been developed in, in all for the Sierra Nevada protected area. They are prototypes for general applicable uh, of general applicable models in any other mountain areas, but it should be adapted for sure, for sure. And basically, they have all in common with the combined remote sensing data from airborne or satellite sensors with biochemical data and also ancillary data such as, such as uh, social media. The text and images, digital elevation models, roads, uh, etc. Uh, as you know, uh, Sierra Nevada is a Mediterranean biodiversity hotspot. Uh, it can, we, we contain and we, we have a lot of data on this mountain. It has been surveyed uh, for centuries by naturalists. Uh, it, it is also officially declared by the Andalusian government as a global change uh, observatory. And it focuses. It has been the focus of many scientists that uh, have done their research career uh, there. Uh, our models are developed mostly on the cloud using state-of-the-art modeling and artificial intelligence uh, techniques. Um, they are they use indicators uh, for a, the ecosystem service uh, demand uh, also. Uh, uh, or for the supply, so we combine both demand and supply. Uh, we are also developing different scenarios of land use land cover change uh, that can be uh, tested and, and uh, uh, to see whether the, the effects of land use land cover change affect the provision, uh, sorry, the, the supply or the demand of these services. And we uh, also are developing these models with the aim to include them as a vector research environment within LightWatch area. This is the first example, the seed, seed dispersal uh, model, where uh, basically it's a, a tool to um, guide managers uh, on the effects of different clearing uh, uh, applications of the plant plantations that are very dense and more specific. They have this fallen uh, decay in southern Spain, in many places in the Mediterranean region, indeed. Uh, uh, the idea is uh, to provide uh, uh, different uh, environmental variables related to elevation, animal radiation, tree density, uh, the different pine plantation uh, practice, and uh, the, the ways that we want to different ways to clear them, uh, the natural forest patches that can, where natural seeds or native seeds can uh, be uh, taken from, the, it's the source for natural seeds, sorry, um, also cropland patches, uh, the past land covers and also the abundance of dispersers uh, to have the border effect uh, on the, the source of seeds uh, that can um, Mm, uh, grow in these uh, cleared patches. Uh, it is uh, implemented in Google Earth Engine. It was in, in our studio, but now it's also uh, implemented in Google Earth Engine. Uh, second example is uh, great. Sorry, this uh, first example was um, built by Antonio Perez Luque and Rafino Amora from the University of Granada. This second example. It comes from the work of uh, Carlos Pacera and Ana Belén uh, Robles uh, from the uh, Estación de 
del Jaimín, del CSIC, the, the Spanish Council for Research in Granada, and basically using uh, regression equations uh, from uh, annual precipitation and different bioclimatic zones that uh, capture temperatures in uh, monthly changes in monthly temperatures. Uh, we uh, use these equations to provide the uh, uh, amount of metabolic energy available for cows and sheep in the different shrublands and grasslands of uh, Sierra Nevada. We also provide a have analysis distance to uh, uh, assess the certainty of this model. Uh, so together with the amount of energy, we provide an uncertainty for, for such a, an amount and to allow the user to uh, discard uh, non-realistic uh, uncertain values. Another uh, model is the uh, subwater hydrological model has been developed by Javier Herrero Group in, in the University of Granada and University of Cordoba. Uh, it, the model has different services like flood prevention, surface water supply, surface runoff, aquifer recharge, evapotranspiration and erosion uh, prevention. And it allows you to uh, set different years and uh, it uses weather meteorological like stations and satellite information uh, and physics equations to to model the the different uh, the, all these uh, variables. It also allows to change the type of vegetation to see the effect of these land use and public changes on on these services. And also, it, it allows to uh, to change uh, climate uh, to use climate change scenarios to see the effect of, of climate change on these. Uh, services. Another method, model is the above ground carbon storage. It uses the equations from Navarrete Poyatos. It's, it has been uh, implemented by the group of uh, Rafael Navarro and Maria Ángeles from the University of Córdoba. Uh, it is based on the LIDAR flight of uh, 2020. It has 0.5 points per square meter. And uh, so far, we have provided biomass for uh, pine plantations, but we are also building the models for other types of uh, forests and also for uh, shrublands. Um, uh, we are so far we are only modeling uh, forests with uh, a group of dominant species, but not mixed forests like pine, uh, pine, different pine. Forests uh, at the specific at the species level and also at the gender level and also for Kerkus Pyrenaica uh, and Kerkus uh, Recumifolia forests and other shrublands uh, together. Or together. Uh, another model is the estimation of cultural ecosystem services using social media uh, comments and images of so the text and then pictures that people change exchange in, in Flickr and Twitter. Uh, we are doing this not only in Sierra Nevada, but all, in all the mountain uh, national parks of Spain and, and Portugal, including the Canary Islands. Uh, the, what we are doing basically is using deep learning models to analyze these pictures uh, and texts that are shared, and then using ecological niche models, uh, we uh, are uh, uh, estimating what are the environmental conditions that uh, favor uh, the people share pictures and what type of pictures from the different um, places and then we are uh, assessing how climate change or land use changes could affect the provision of these uh, cultural services. Uh, <laughs> last uh, one is the land use land cover change model. We have trained a Bayesian network using uh, many workshops with um, stakeholders, with uh, uh, farmers from Alpujarra, from Sierra Nevada, with managers and with scientists uh, to uh, train this network uh, to know who, uh, what are the factors that uh, determine that a farmer decides to change from a traditional uh, for instance, a traditional uh, cropland system to an intensive cropland system, or to abandon the traditional agriculture, or to change to 
to <coughs> have a ranching instead of uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, this um, uh, allows us to create possible scenarios for land use changes to combine them with climate changes uh, so we can not only assess in the, in the past services, not only to know the effect of climate change on the supply of these services, but also uh, to assess the effect of land cover changes on the supply of those uh, services, for instance, as the last one in the cultural services. Uh, in not only we are including the supply of these uh, previous services, we are including the supply, we are also uh, assessing the demand of ecosystem services. In, for instance, we have completed uh, a social ecological uh, ecosystem uh, identification. Uh, so we are uh, with a clustering analysis of more than 80 socioeconomic variables. Uh, many of them were uh, considering ecosystem services demand, not only provision. Uh, we are characterizing green and red loops in these municipalities of Sierra Nevada, uh, and we are including the well being implications of <coughs> uh, these uh, demand services and and these socioeconomic uh, variables. Uh, so basically, we are trying to explain the provision and demand of ecosystem services using these uh, social ecological ecosystems. OK, well, this is all. Uh, if you have any questions regarding this uh, presentation, you can also uh, address Ana Mellano, Ana del Aguila, or Jaipa Jaldi. And um, myself, Domingo Alcaraz Segura, or Javier Martinez Lopez at the University of Granada. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the uh, workshop these days. I'm very sorry that I could not attend the conference. Bye bye. Thanks again to Domingo for giving his voice to the last two presentations. We are now up to the last contribution of this morning session, which is from Julio Paneke from Lake Cherik. And the title is Leveraging Remote Sensing Services to Introduce Autonomous Robots in the Wild. Uh, Julio, same work here. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Julio Paneke, and I have been in the robotics community for quite a while, but this last year I joined Nightboard and I'm trying to, to see what is the, the link and the main joint between both communities. And so this project that I'm presenting you today, uh, which is smart in the context of these two Indar and Shunha projects, is uh, a bit of a future direction, a future way, where both communities can connect. So, in these projects, we are interested in monitoring or in improving the monitoring cycle of the special areas of conservation and also in natural parks. I think that we have seen many examples these days that uh, monitoring natural parks, monitoring special areas of conservation is a great way of gathering useful information that tells us, hey, uh, you should make this decision, you should make this other decision. We have seen examples with, uh, with Bat, with Kestrels, with many different animals. So, in short, we want to have the, these ecosystems as monitored as possible, but also we want to leave them as quiet and as untouched as possible, because we have to respect wildlife. And typically, we do this monitoring by two techniques. One, by remote sensing, and two, by using sensor networks. But these techniques have some disadvantages, okay? First, sorry. First uh, for remote sensing. And I'm going from up to bottom, okay? Uh, in the case of satellite imagery, we have a very high temporal resolution. We have revisit times of a couple of days. But uh, many times we are lacking spatial resolution. This image, for example, is not blurred by the PowerPoint and so on. It's basically 
a 10 by each pixel is a 10 by 10 meter area. So with that, many times we are not able to gather all the information that we want. Then, in the case of national flag campaigns, we have more resolution, we have better images, but we have one every year, every two years, every three years, so they are also not that useful many times. And lastly, we can make continuous drone flights and we can have really good accuracy and really good resolution. But if we do that, uh, maybe we are not being very respectful with the light. Well, like, for example, you can see that the koala here is not happy with the idea of having a drone near him. Okay, in the case of sensor networks, In the case of sensor networks, we can use them to monitor a lot of different variables, and this is a really good thing. But when we want to monitor something, we have to get to the place, install the sensor network, install the sensor, and uh, start monitoring whatever we want to do. It's a very good approach for long, long temporal monitoring of one specific variable, but it's not very flexible. When we want to install something new, when we want to monitor a new variable, it's not flexible, we have to go to the place, many times with a Land Rover, 4x4, it's very fun to drive, but it's not good for, for ride life, and we are not really respecting the animals and respecting the flora in there. So, how do we propose, in the context of these projects, to start trying to improve this monitoring cycle? I'm always uh, <laughs> confused with the buttons. Okay, how are we propose, uh, proposing to improve this? We can use quadrupedal robots, which are quite inspired robots that maybe you have been seeing during these last years. I have not put the Boston Dynamics here, but uh, it's also one of, uh, of the possible quadrupedal robots. We can use these kind of robots because they are silent, they are uh, very energy efficient, they can go through deep, many different terrains, they can go uh, not only in flat areas, but they can also climb uh, maybe 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, depending on the robot, of slopes. And uh, with solar charging, we can introduce these robots and leave them forever, or virtually forever, in the wild. So they can become privileged monitors of this kind of special areas of conservation. Okay, but uh, this approach, of course, also has some challenges, and that's what we are talking about today. First of all, we need to know the when and the where should we monitor different variables. We need to, the researchers need to say, hey, I want to monitor, for example, the consequences of this drought here in this park, or I want to monitor uh, the population of bugs in this other place. But we need to know what to do, because the robots are also expensive, and we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot have a thousand robots uh, for each park. So this is something that we need to know. Then we also need to know how to go from point A to point B. Because, as you can see here, for example, you will say, hey, from here to here, straight line. But you have a slope. But you have some animals that you don't want to disturb. But you have a drought. But you have a flooding, sorry, that you want to avoid. So you need to compute which is the good path to go from one point to another. And also, avoiding animals. So, in short, the first question is something that should be answered by scientists. But we, as LiveWatch, can provide as much data as possible for that to happen. And then, uh, for example, we're providing satellite data, we're federating a lot of, detail, a lot of different databases, we are uh, introducing sensor data that is already available in different parts and different uh, areas, and with that, we can help scientists make that question, no? make the, the, the answer. Okay, we should monitor this, this, and this in this order. Maybe I'm more interested in this variable. Uh, now this has changed. I want to go to the other place. So, first question solved, potentially. And uh, let's focus on the second one. Can we use data, can we use workflows that are already available in LiveWatch to produce feasible paths for robots? So, can we join these communities in such a way that things that were thought for monitoring wildlife are also useful for sending a robot to monitor wildlife to gather data for monitoring wildlife. <laughs> okay, you see the link now. Uh, and then we are going to be tender focusing on that. But also, can we use real time data to improve and to update our routes, taking into account information, for example, where do we predict that the animals are? The answer is yes. 
So this is a very general scheme of uh, Lightwatch data workflows for spatial data, okay, for satellite imagery, for different fidelity data databases, for national flights, for different medium scale flights that, for example, in the ERDF projects uh, we are doing a lot. Okay, so we will gather all of these two ways of uh, two kinds of information and process it in specialized workflows for remote sensing data. With that, we produce intermediate variables. I think we already here all know that, but can we use these intermediate variables? Are they useful for navigating with robots? And always <laughs> confusing. I'm going to uh, just present two of these workflows that are useful for navigating with robots. First of all, uh, the high throughput workflow for later, uh, <laughs> laser cam. Okay, our uh, colleagues at Amsterdam have performed, uh, have done this workflow, which is uh, very beautiful and uh, the paper is very well written. You can check it online, uh, where they compute a lot of structural information with lighter data. That structural information is highly useful for navigating with robots, as, uh, as you can already predict. One more. For example, here in the ERD projects, and also Pro Haifa and her team uh, in Granada, they have uh, performed a workflow for computing from satellite imagery the, and for detecting where are the straps and also classify, but just detect uh, where are the straps is enough for robotics. Uh, in different uh, mountain systems, but uh, this is a technology that could also be applied to other kind of uh, ecosystems. Okay, so we have a lot of structural information, and also we have uh, imagery to map straps. With that, I'm telling you, we can navigate. For example, here you have some structural data with lidar, uh, and uh, you can use the, the laser fan, for example, to, to to get this kind of data with vegetation height and vegetation density and also the different heights of the terrain, you are able, uh, and I'm not going to bother you with robotics details, but you are able to produce uh, a useful data uh, for generating paths of how can a robot go from point A to point B. So, we can use inclination maps that come from this high resolution LiDAR data. We have vegetation density, uh, so we should avoid uh, places where that have a lot of vegetation density because it's very possible that the robot cannot navigate through them. We have vegetation high, and with that we can compute solar exposure to, for example, navigate while always charging the battery, but also in summer maybe to try to avoid uh, a lot of sun uh, so the robot is not heated up. Okay, so it's very useful information that was taught for uh, biodiversity monitoring, but it's highly useful for robotics for biodiversity monitoring. Uh, and so, even if we have more or less solved, and I can tell you that with this, more or less the problem of generating the path is solved, we still have some open questions, and this presentation was thought more of a, as a debate, uh, as an opening debate for, for you to maybe reach me during lunch, I don't want to, uh, to interrupt the lunch, but uh, we should debate about and how this is useful, what things should be taken into account, and so on. So, some future challenges that we see is that, first of all, uh, the thing about detecting animal presence <coughs> in real time, I think it's a very important challenge that we have seen a lot of different projects on how to do it, no? or predicting, maybe. Maybe we don't need detection, we need prediction. Uh, that is a very big challenge, because we have a lot of animals and a lot of things that we should not disturb. And, uh, if we, for example, go to an area and want to have some aerial images, some images from, from up, that, um, because we need high resolution images, but not from a drone, then uh, we can introduce other kinds of robots, such as birds, that can go in the quadruped robot to gather this information, another challenge. Then, uh, the third one, which is more than a challenge, is a challenge of communicating is to gather uh, a lot of scientific and say, hey, which would be the kind of sensors that are necessary so we, cannot, we don't have to be coming back and forth to the laboratory every once in a while? What are the best set of sensors to leave this unsupervised as much as possible? And finally, uh, when we are navigating with the robot and we, for example, perceive some uh, some animals, I have seen a lot of uh, workflows for animal prediction, uh, animal uh, perceiving here, and so on, can we 
react to this perception, with this online perception, and first gather data because it's useful, and two, try to avoid the animals and not alter the <coughs> system by using workflows that we already have. And that would be all the, the presentation. And just uh, if you want to ask some questions, I'll start the debate. Thank you, Julio. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Yes. Okay. Um, Agustin Lifka from the University of Sevilla. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's uh, really exciting, challenging, but also exciting. And uh, so my point of view is that it's almost unavoidable that you will need a combined approach, not only the robot, but the robot plus drone or robot plus sensors or something like that. And uh, from the point of view of the path planning, my question would be, are you, uh, so how far is this, this, this approach? Uh, are you planning to make a pilot on a particular area? Because I think maybe you can already pre-design some standard routes and then some random exploring behavior or something like that. So how, how flexible you want this to be or how difficult you think it would be? Okay, yeah. So. I think it's more of a political issue than a uh, path planning or robotics issue. Because basically you want the robot to be in an area that typically this would be owned by, uh, for example, some pilot by us, but, some pilot, but many robots would be owned by natural park administrators and so on. So you want the robot to be in your area. You don't want to go outside or you don't want to go to a, to a place that is very public and uh, you have a lot of people. Uh, that's a very Spanish uh, <laughs> issue. But uh, you don't want the robot to, to, to be super public and to be uh, out in a in road or something. So the limit should be maybe mm, taken by the researchers, not by the algorithm and, and the workflows. It's not something that is limited by the software part. And uh, actually, uh, if you want to start more detailed thing about the planning, um, most broadly could be made in, uh, in using 2D. And when you are planning things in 2D, even if you have different costs for different places, for different areas of the 2D grid, it's very easy to, to plan. So it's very cost effective. If we, if this is something, for example, for buildings where you have 3D and so on, then it gets more complicated. Or for drones, for example, uh, which is the area that, that I come from, uh, it's much more complicated. But in 2D, it's super easy. So it's more a political issue. Of where do you want the robot to be? Is it waterproof? I mean, what about if it crosses in all the snow? What about if it starts raining, like pouring rain? So, uh, the one that I propose to use, which is the cheapest, so, because we always have the, the budget thing, no? uh, in the workplace, it is waterproof. In the emails with the provider, they say, okay, no, no, no waterproof, uh, just uh, don't, don't put it into the rain. We will try to make it waterproof because it's always uh, useful to, to be waterproof. We don't want to, to go and take the road. I have seen some that are very, very impressive. Uh, for example, there is one that has IP68 waterproof. Basically, it can go <coughs> down into a lake or something, and no problem. I, I think IP68 is until like five meters. So uh, that, that one uh, is a monster. So they, they have like a videos of it with a if with a wave in the back going into a lake and like that, no problem. A lot of water everywhere. So it depends on how much you, you want to spend. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. Very impressive. Um, I got intrigued by the uh, cold bird or the, the cold worker bird. Uh, so what would be the practical difference between launching a drone, a, a quadcopter or something like that, and a cold bird drone, cold worker drone? Uh, so I, I say co-worker bird because it would be on the back of the of the road. So basically, the, the practicality is so it's not about the practicality or, or what is the difference between them, but the, the main difference here for us it would be the noise and how because drones are, are a lot noisy. 
some some researchers are telling me that horses don't bother about drones and so on. But I think it's not uh, because if for humans it's not uh, easy to be near a drone. For animals, for sure, it's, it's also not. So that's the main difference. Birds are not making mostly any noise. Maybe some flapping, uh, but uh, a robot bird like this. So it's like uh, very small, something like this, and uh, you're just hearing some small flapping of the of the wings. Uh, so it's very uh, efficient. It's very um, yeah, uh, low low footprint in terms of noise. That's the main difference. Then it's also much higher to maneuver, much uh, harder to maneuver, because the research uh, state for uh, drones is. Uh, much more advanced than for birds. Actually, I come from a group where we were also doing robotic birds. Uh, so I, I, I know a lot about that. But uh, and that's why I know that it's a challenge. But it's also, it has a lot of advantages in terms of respecting wildlife. Thank you very much. We are like out of time. <laughs> the three minutes are closed, and I think we are all starving. Thank you very much, Julio. Thanks to all the speakers of today's session. Uh, we are now for lunch in the patio. Let's be back here at quarter past three sharp, please. Enjoy your lunch. Now this fourth lunch uh, session. Uh, I'm Iria Soto. I'm working at the ICT for in Lightwatch Eric. I'm working with agroecology. And uh, I will be chairing this session. And in this session, we will have uh, three speakers that will provide us with different approaches on monitoring uh, biodiversity in different uh, ecosystems. So, first, I would like to give the floor to Carmen Ruiz Delgado. Uh, she's a researcher from the University of Pablo de la Vida, and she's an environmental scientist with professional experience on aquatic ecology and metric uh, community. So this uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, well, uh, my name is Carmen Reed. I'm attending. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he suggests that uh, presenters go closer to the uh, ah, presentation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm attending to this conference to present CGAP, it's a center in genomics and biodiversity analysis. Uh, well, this uh, center uh, is uh, a part of the uh, regional. I don't know. <laughs> this gap, this center is a part of the regional network of the observation of global change uh, within the uh, global infrastructure of the projects uh, in Dalo. Uh, this uh, uh, the the objective or the principal aim of this center is uh, um, composed by a um, multidisciplinary uh, team uh, uh, with uh, ecologists, um, limnologists, uh, bioinformatics, and um, uh, genetics to uh, monitoring biodiversity in different ecosystems. Uh, now I will present a case study about uh, the environmental DNA metagenomic in uh, royal ecosystems, but uh, the, the aim of this uh, center is to, to establish uh, a standardized methodology uh, to analyze uh, and monitor the uh, biodiversity in a non-invasive way uh, to, uh, with the advantages to, to monitoring a species that are difficult to, to sample or identify with uh, traditional methods. Uh, this uh, genomic data uh, will be a uh, relation, uh, study the relationship with other uh, variables, uh, physical, climatological, and chemical variables, in uh, standardized uh, data with the uh, collaboration with language EPIC. Well, the uh, environmental D DNA techniques uh, can be classified uh, whether one or similar species. Uh, are identified simultaneously, uh, meta uh, barcoding or meta barcoding if several species are simultaneously uh, identified. And the regular making that we can be used uh, will depend on the taxonomic level that identification is certain to reach for genus or family level or specific level. 
In the case of Hectaria, we represent, we uh, apply environmental DNA metabacloning to uh, analyze the community composition, uh, uh, identify several uh, types of organisms, prokaryotes and eukaryotes organisms uh, simultaneously, using a specific makers uh, based on genia barcodes. So, uh, the environmental DNA in aquatic biomonitoring uh, allow to detect uh, single species, for example, invasive species, or to uh, identify the community composition and analyze the biodiversity of uh, similar species simultaneously, or uh, to uh, introduce this information about uh, biodiversity in uh, biotic indices, for example, to apply water framework directive. Environmental DNA have uh, several advantages. Uh, maybe the, the main advantages allow to quickly and cheaply obtain uh, the community uh, composition uh, independently of the taxonomy knowledge about these uh, species. Uh, the case study that we were working we are working now, is the uh, characterization of the planktonic communities of microorganisms, uh, eukaryotic and prokaryotic organisms associated with a rival ecosystem with different uh, anthropogenic pressures. Um, our study area allocated on the western of Andalusia. So at the regional scale, we established uh, uh, 56 uh, rivers uh, located at three river basins uh, like uh, Guadalquivir, uh, Tinto, Oviedo, Piedra, and Guadalete, uh, with different land uses. And at local scale, we uh, establish each sampling point along the Guadaira River. Guadaira is uh, one of the main tributaries of the Guadalquivir but is profoundly uh, affected by anthropogenic pressure, mainly uh, industrial, agriculture, and water waste discharge that uh, affect water quality and the consistent service that you might provide. So, uh, in the field, we establish at each river one, a transit of 100 meters, and we obtain three uh, replicates of one liter, and we uh, filter uh, these uh, water samples in the in the field, but with the uh, using a, a vacuum pump. And then in the laboratory, we uh, carry out the uh, extraction of uh, DNA retaining these uh, filters, uh, previously to the uh, amplification reaction using a set of a specific primers to uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes based on uh, the amplification of the air in uh, genes for prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And then the bioinformatics prepared the, the libraries to the um, apply the sequencing on Illumina Minisec platform. Well, this is the part of bioinformatics um, related to the meta metagenomic uh, study uh, contain th uh, four main uh, steps. Uh, first, uh, during the quality filtering, the sequences, uh, we remove the sequences with low quality. Then in clustering, we group the, the sequences uh, based on their similarity to each other to a group into operational taxonomic units. These uh, operational taxonomic units are compared to references uh, databases to assign the, uh, the taxa uh, based on the sequence similarity. And finally, in the step of data analysis, this uh, list uh, of operational taxonomic units were analyzed to obtain the taxonomic composition of uh, each uh, river and uh, its relationship with uh, other environmental variables. For example, for the Guadalajara River, we uh, measure uh, different physical and chemical variables like uh, organic matter, the uh, oxygen of the water, or nutrients. Mm -hmm. 
well, in this picture, uh, we uh, show uh, the general workflow in C in C app. Uh, now, after the experimental uh, work, we are uh, um, analyze the taxonomy composition, uh, uh, the assignment of uh, operational tax, uh, taxonomical units to the uh, with reference uh, databases to obtain the, the composition of the community. Thank you. Uh, so the objective of this project is uh, to connect uh, biodiversity data with environmental data and the, the use uh, of this information by managers or environmental managers and other end users and uh, use uh, this uh, data about biodiversity and the use in monitoring uh, this uh, diversity uh, to improve the decision making in the management of aquatic ecosystem. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Carmen, now you open the, the floor for the audience. Does anyone want to ask a question? We have the mic. Thank you. There are many uh, eDNA projects, I think, already running in, in Europe or in the Netherlands as well. So, uh, the GRI's project. So, is a coordination between the efforts in uh, setting up the database, the reference database, or in the analysis? Or uh, is, is it necessary to set up more collaboration? What do you think? I think that it's a, a big project to apply the environmental DNA. Uh, is um, and necessary to, to improve these reference databases to, to knowledge their, their community composition. And maybe it is uh, necessary to, to analyze together taxonomic identification with uh, uh, the DNA uh, sequences and to, to improve the, the identification. Okay. Another question, number 10, from I think that the four stages that you showed there in your workflow are the same with Pema. <laughs> Not any additional last question or we pass? Okay, so now is thank you very much for thank you. a nice and interesting presentation. <laughs>
and also an increasing role of the community science to generate labels for these images and also to provide new data. When I started this project, my ninth idea was that we placed the cameras at the, the Lunyan National Park, we generated a lot of data, and we made excellent uh, ecological inference. Uh, it was a somehow naive idea because the path is much more difficult because uh, uh, camera traps generate images, and images are not data. You have to store them, you have to manage them, and you have to process them to translate into the data. So, Perhaps the most important step in this uh, uh, translation process uh, is the, the labeling that is not always simple. It can be very it can be easy, like in the top left image where you can see a genet, but it can be difficult very, very often for many reasons. That, these are just a few examples. So you can uh, uh, label single image by yourself, that is doable if you have a very specific uh, goal and a small project. Otherwise, if you need some help from citizen science or artificial intelligence, that's our case. We have generated more than 4 million images in just a couple of years. This is our citizen science project, the Iberian Camera Project in the Zoo Universe, that is one of the most important platforms of citizen science. We ask people to uh, say how, uh, which species uh, they are uh, watching in the, in the picture. Uh, they can choose among the uh, eating uh, classes, uh, including uh, empty and uh, older mammal species. Once they do that, we ask them to say how many individuals they are watching in the images. So the, the output of this process uh, it's very useful because we get uh, the present substance uh, and the count data that are very valuable information for uh, ecology. So I, I, I want to be talking a lot about artificial intelligence for a limit uh, uh, of time because I'm not an expert in that, but I just want to remark a, a, a crucial trade-off between the complexity of the model and the performance you can reach. So you can see here in the, in the right part of the table, that is a study, a study published by uh, Belleth in uh, Mythos and Ecology and Evolution. I don't know why the text box has disappeared. And uh, you can see two kinds of artificial intelligence models. Uh, the first one is uh, a wide open science that is supported by Google. They can recognize up to uh, 1,300 species, and on the other, developed by Microsoft and the Smithsonian Institute, you can see mega detector, they can recognize four classes, and the performance it tends to be much higher when the question is simpler. That's why I think that we need to develop also local artificial intelligence systems, because uh, if you can tailor your system to a study, uh, to your study species, uh, that when I say local, I do not mean uh, I mean, for example, a biogeographic region or a country. You can uh, attain much better performance like is the case with our uh, uh, artificial intelligence model. And here, this can, uh, uh, after that, I can introduce our study system. We have 60 randomly placed cameras at the, the Doniana National Park in the new football zone. And they are uh, set up to take a three photo sequence uh, with a one second of delay. This is an, an extreme simplification of the protocol that we have set up because the protocol starts from the very beginning in the, in the field and then uh, at the, the statistical analysis. But you can see that we first have a quality check of the images. This quality check means to extract uh, metadata from the images and to uh, correct uh, errors that are very, very uh, frequent, and then to resize the images to assign an uh, individual uh, identifier to each uh, photo. And after that, we have processed the photo. These are sent all of them to our model, the convolutional neural network model, and then just a part of them are, are sent to the Zooniverse. And when, you, when we get the, these uh, labels from Zooniverse, we validate them to have 100% uh, 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 sure 
images error free that we use to, to do uh, artificial intelligence training. And uh, over these steps, we also are generating uh, data that can be stored like essential biodiversity variables in the data sets. Uh, I'm going to show you just a few examples, a few examples of what we are working now uh, in this project. And uh, this is the first table uh, we are working in, in this moment. We are comparing the citizen science uh, versus uh, our artificial intelligence model. And we have seen, I, I think that you cannot, but the triangles are artificial intelligence, or maybe that I have most glasses uh, and you can, but the triangle are artificial intelligence uh, uh, per, uh, performance, and the circles are geodiverse uh, performance. You can see that artificial intelligence can do a better job uh, finding the species present in the image that, are, that is the sensitivity, the record. And if we see the, the speed of these two systems, we can see that in uh, artificial intelligence you can uh, process like 10, 15 images per second, and our Zoniverse uh, uh, system can make, uh, for example, one on average, one per minute. And also that uh, the if we see which images, which are the characteristics of the images that are probably classified by artificial intelligence and not by citizen science, we can see that most of them are nighttime image. There are just three examples. This is a human. Artificial intelligence can see that. This is a Janet. And this is a red fox. Uh, these are just three random samples from, uh, from our set of images. It just randomly picked up three. And you can see that it is not easy for a human to see, to see that. So the next uh, uh, topic we are working now is about the presence of dogs at Doniano, but it's very worrisome. We have detected at least uh, uh, 35, uh, 35 uh, different dogs. And uh, in uh, 60 cameras, and we have seen that these dogs uh, can be in packs of uh, up to five dogs, uh, and uh, they are all over uh, the Donia National Park. We are worried because they can prey on the native species, they can compete with the uh, native species, they can transmit diseases like, for example, the distemper virus to lynxes, and they can, in, uh, in general, generate wildlife disturbance, and the whole range of a few of these dogs uh, uh, seems uh, seem very, very broad based on our data. Next, uh, to end our work in this time, we have just developed four prototypes to make uh, an on-site classification with our uh, AI model and to alert in real time for the presence of the unwanted species. We have these uh, four, yeah, yeah, it's just uh, the, two, the final one. We have uh, uh, four prototypes, uh, two of them are working uh, by sending the image uh, via GSM, and two are working by sending the image uh, via Wi-Fi. And uh, these uh, prototypes uh, include the uh, Raspberry P4, and uh, uh, we are using a, a passive infrared sensor uh, during uh, the night, and uh, the frame difference in uh, framework over the daytime images. And when they detect uh, the movement of an animal, they take uh, a certain number of images. They can be, these prototypes can be accessed remotely, so we can change all the parameterization. They do on-site species classification, and if it, is, if it is a target species, we decide which is the target species, they send the image in the real time with the classification. So, just to finish my presentation, I want to say that our idea now, in the step we are right now, is uh, we want to optimize our system we want uh, to optimize our system, especially in terms of uh, interoperability with other uh, platforms and with uh, R and Python libraries, for example. And we want to scale up to other areas, especially protected areas, not as possibly. But uh, for that end, we are now uh, searching for new funding and new collaborations. That's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Simone, for the presentation and for showing all those different integrative methods. And I open the floor now for the audience. If does anyone, yeah, at the end. You, thank you for the presentation. You, you mentioned 35 different dogs uh, identified by the camera traps. Is it done by artificial intelligence or is it done by humans? Or the, the individual recognition uh, has been made uh, by manual labeling because we had like uh, 50 images of dogs and it was useless to develop an individual recognition system just for that, for now at least. And you think it would be possible to go to the... No, it's not. The no, it's not impossible. It's possible. Right. In fact, there is uh, one of the platforms uh, uh, that is uh, uh, Redmi, and they do individual recognition uh, uh, using a label images taken by social networks. And they apply these, uh, these labels to develop individual recognition systems for many species. Yeah. There are two more questions. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you. I really like your presentation. Uh, I would like to know if you have problems to classify the, the photos that have, for example, a leg or a tail or something like that. And an additional question. <laughs> Uh, which model do you use for computer vision and for artificial intelligence? Yeah. Actually, I do not use anything because I am an ecologist and I am <laughs> not the person who is developing this. But my colleague Manuel Regundet, and uh, they are using a, a convolutional neural network based on the FISM-NET uh, uh, 3 architecture. This is what I, I know how to yeah. Hi, really nice presentation again. I think I was going to make the same question, so uh, can you repeat the name because I didn't hear it properly? The there, is, there is in TensorFlow, the library in Python, and the architecture of the, the deep learning model is uh, uh, efficient net D3. There okay. is now D4, I know. And uh, do you uh, have any experience uh, in trying to label the dog images before doing manually? Uh, did you try to label it with the internet or already available data sets? Uh, could that work in some way to provide you for the data that you needed? When we started the project, we were using uh, images from other collaborators and from the internet also. There are repositories with uh, labeled images uh, available to the public. But with the past of time, we are doing this process of training of the artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence at Cyclic by using uh, the images labeled by its universe and afterwards validated by us. The last uh, question, please. Yeah, uh, I, I assume that you also fear that there will be more and more dogs. Uh, uh, that's, that's how it works usually. So I was just thinking, thinking out loud, saying, can you couple your system of detections with something that is connected to birth control of the dogs? Is it possible at all, or is it just a very wild idea? You mean that by detecting dogs in real time, for example? Or De detecting dogs and then immediately giving something for birth control? For birth sure. control, yeah. I know there is people now in the Dutnuba lab who is working uh, with artificial intelligence applied in uh, waterfed uh, uh, colonies, but the scope there, it could be easily changed, but the scope for now is to read the, the rings. It could be also applied to other, to other situations. So if, if you want to remove them, you can shoot them, but maybe there are better methods than that. Thank you very much, Simone, and all the audience for the presentation. And now we we'll move to the next uh, presenter, it's uh, Gregor Aljansi, I hope I managed to, <laughs> from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. 
and he's also the head of the Tula Arcade Laboratory at the Faculty of uh, Biotechnology. And we will present the challenges and some preliminary results in within virtual laboratories to monitor proteus and genus and its cards groundwater habitat. The floor is yours. It's an independent uh, 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 laboratory, uh, but first of all, a kind regards from uh, our colleagues of the Slovenia uh, Life Watch uh, to, to uh, everybody who organized this uh, beautiful and, uh, uh, meeting in Sevilla for the hospitality and our efforts. Uh, we will uh, present. Uh, an uh, idea at this stage still at the very uh, early development of uh, two uh, virtual laboratories, uh, both very uh, tightly connected, forming really a, a one a good uh, logical system. Uh, the uh, 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 cast groundwater habitats virtual laboratory uh, developed by the uh, Karst Research uh, Insti Institute of the uh, Zaretsa Sazu, the uh, head institution of Life Watch Slovenia, uh, will uh, develop uh, uh, a uh, laboratory to, to study mechanisms and processes of the uh, groundwater uh, flow, uh, in particular the uh, transport of contaminants uh, or pollutants, uh, which is of course the main concern and the most the main drive uh, for uh, research of uh, the uh, uh, Cape Amphibian uh, problems, uh, 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 which would be linked to the its. Uh, uh, changes in its ecology and, and in particular uh, uh, behavior. I will talk mostly about the uh, uh, Proteus watch uh, the lab, uh, but I should start with just a brief presentation of this unique uh, Cape Amphibian, one of the uh, 14 perhaps uh, species around the world of amphibians that managed to develop, to evolve, uh, to, to uh, colonize the uh, cave uh, of subterranean environment. Uh, just a few quick uh, facts uh, why it is worth to, to uh, put such an effort to to study this animal in, in its natural habitat, so difficult to access, as we will say, see later, uh, being uh, the first cave animal ever uh, scientifically described in the, or in the uh, 18th century, uh, becoming a flag species of uh, subterranean fauna, uh, uh, being a uh, top predator of a uh, groundwater or subterranean aquatic habitat. Uh, interestingly, uh, being the only vertebrate in, in that uh, ecosystem, uh, why? because every other uh, species are, are just invertebrates. And of course, uh, uh, being uh, so vulnerable to, to pollution changes of of uh, the uh, ecosystem, hence uh, uh, protected by national and, and European uh, 
uh, in legislation such as the Habitat uh, Directive and uh, Natura 2000 network. And also uh, featuring many uh, unique, uh, one could say, <laughs> strange uh, adaptations to cave life, such as uh, extreme lifespan of we don't know, but uh, just uh, assuming uh, spanning up to 100 years with very long uh, uh, reproductive cycles, which make such uh, animal even more prone to, to collapse when the uh, situation is changing the uh, ecosystem. And uh, perhaps not a cave related adaptation, but uh, certainly very interesting. What uh, an animal with uh, one of the largest uh, genomes. Uh, the challenges of monitoring of, of subterranean habitats uh, is obviously related to its inaccessibility to, to men, not to pollution, uh, unfortunately. This is a, a, just a diagram of, of karst landscape. Uh, one could see uh, really accessible to, to men only on a few places uh, except of the cast uh, cast spring from where we collect the, the drinking water uh, mostly uh, through, through these fissures and, and uh, cracks uh, and sh uh, shafts uh, we can then descend down up to 300 meters to the uh, to the groundwater. Of course, the darkness is also one of the challenges, uh, uh, particularly for, for monitoring oriented in uh, collecting visual uh, visual uh, information. We need to 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 have uh, our own light, uh, infrared light, uh, infrared reflectors, uh, which spend. Uh, even more energy that must be uh, must be somehow carried down to the spot of the place of where we where we collect data, uh, and that's often just as far as the the caver or the researcher would have to crawl. Uh, that is several kilometers uh, from the entrance to the to the place where we can then observe the, these uh, creatures. So one of the solutions, uh, at least uh, uh, so far, were, was, were, were the cave laboratories, uh, uh, same natural uh, subterranean uh, research infrastructures where we can uh, uh, conduct long-term observations of, of, uh, uh, to learn about the life of, of these uh, uh, secretive animals. <clears throat> one such being the Tula Cave Laboratory in, in Slovenia and the other still in existence, uh, the more famous uh, uh, subterranean laboratory of uh, Molise Cave in France. Uh, just to go quickly through the, uh, to have an impression how the methods of the observation have de developed through time, through uh, following the, the uh, technology from the classical observations uh, using uh, visible red light in the 60s and then uh, early automated uh, uh, data collection using, uh, using uh, just uh, photographic film and then the first uh, analog infrared video became more available in the late uh, 90s and uh, the uh, digital infrared uh, IP uh, video monitoring of today. So these are the uh, crucial, crucial uh, experience we, we need to, to go to transfer this uh, idea uh, from semi-natural uh, ex situ observation to, to in situ because we need to know what's happening in the uh, natural habitats uh, uh, regarding the uh, particularly pollution and, and conservation status of, of 
uh, cave uh, systems. Uh, cave diving, of course, is, is a solution that we were also using, but uh, I may say from my own experience that this is uh, really one of the most dangerous uh, things. Uh, not even worth, because the, the gain is so little. On a one hour cave dive, you really have only a few minutes time to collect data, to observe the animals, and of course that is not enough to learn about its life. <coughs> the, uh, not, of course not all uh, parts of its habitat are so hardly accessible. There are some uh, places where you can get and set uh, just simple trap cameras uh, in, in the cave or, or at the uh, car springs where uh, you know, as an uh, entrance to, to its habitat. Uh, we should not also forget about the uh, electromagnetic pollution that we bring into caves. Caves do not have uh, a mobile phone uh, signal. You know, there's literally no, no electro, very little human electromagnetic uh, smoke. <coughs> and also to, to choose a compromise between the effort uh, and the, uh, the gain. Uh, just to mention, but we'll just keep it in this short presentation, uh, we are also trying to involve other, other uh, national uh, life watch members, such as the uh, Belgian, uh, which have where they have uh, important uh, experience in uh, camera trap, uh, and just to conclude uh, where we are so far, so we, we are using the opportunity of the Tular Cave Laboratory to to have uh, to start to test the equipment uh, to uh, particularly the of course the main. Uh, challenges how to to uh, to uh, collect uh, uh, behavioral data the, the uh, requisition the, the uh, which model to to use to to detect the animals to uh, we started with some open source uh, uh, models such as behavior detector uh, and then all this, uh, uh, the, the how, uh, how to uh, analyze then the images, whether we should use just graphic uh, images of or, or, or the video and, and so on. So we are really just at the beginning, although the uh, both uh, virtual laboratories have already become uh, uh, part of the strategic uh, plan of the LifeWatch Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, we open the floor. Does anyone want to pose a question? So I was wondering what, what kind of questions are you hoping to be able to answer when you have a better observation system in place? <coughs> yeah, this will be uh, uh, it's a long, uh, long wish that uh, beside the same natural of, uh, observations we would at some point need uh, observations from nature. This is the, the basis. Because uh, often colleagues were uh, doubting on, on our results, uh, saying that this is just not what's happening in, in nature, but nobody knows. And of course, uh, what we need, we need to, to uh, learn to, to know just the, the life cycle of proteus better in order to be able to preserve it in, in future, I think. This is the long 
long-term goal of, of it. Any other <coughs> question? Let's see one. the survival, for example, of the species, I was uh, impressed by the longevity. Uh, you can uh, use some kind of natural or artificial marking to make a follow-up of individuals. Yeah, uh, there is, uh, this is uh, one such uh, approach that our uh, Hungarian colleagues have uh, cho chosen uh, uh, marking several animals in one of uh, caves in, in Herzegovina, uh, monitoring their uh, their uh, foraging, their movement uh, once a year, coming to interesting results that Photos doesn't uh, coming back uh, after one year. The animal, about twenty animals that were marked uh, with uh, uh, elastomers uh, inserted in skin were still there, not, uh, not far than one meter away. But of course, uh, what I'm uh, questioning myself, what are they doing during the, the year? <laughs> so this is, uh, so we need uh, uh, real-time information, we need uh, cameras, it's, uh, we need uh, to see what the animal is actually doing, because they are certainly not sitting there as we know from, from our laboratory. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the three speakers. Uh, we are now moving to the next uh, session, which is on ecosystem and habitat mapping and the One Health uh, approach. So thank you everyone for your interesting and appealing question and the discussion. Thank you.